Welcome to The Open Road, where home is where you park it. I'm Tanya, and this is my husband Dave, and that's Brady and Bailey, and we have been living in our camper van for over two years. You know, living in a camper van full-time is not just a lifestyle, it's an adventure. Imagine waking up to a new view every morning, from mountain vistas to beachfront sunrises. It's about freedom, exploration, and embracing the unexpected. So, buckle up as we dive into this nomadic world of RV life and our complete guide to living in a camper van. You know, living in a camper van can be a liberating and fulfilling lifestyle choice. It allows you to travel, see new places, and if you're up for it, you can live the most minimalist lifestyle you choose. However, if you're new to the camper van living life, it can be daunting to know exactly where to start. Well, the universe has brought you here for a reason, because today we're gonna share with you nine crucial tips to starting your life in a camper van. Let's rock. All right, so let's kick this off first by saying, do your research and try living in a van before you buy it. We recommend renting different types and sizes of camper vans to learn first whether you truly enjoy living in a camper van and also to get used to the lifestyle. Living in a camper van can be very challenging at times, so trying it out is very important. Yes, that's right. And second, what van features can you live with and what can you live without? I mean, there's a lot of things that goes into the process of purchasing a van. Now, what we did, we rented quite a few from class B's to class C's and by doing so it really helped shape the direction in terms of what RV we wanted to purchase. Choosing the right van. Now when choosing the right van or RV for that perfect van lifestyle well you need to take in a few major factors. One the size, two the fuel efficiency and definitely the cost because those things can range anywhere from the high to the lows and a bunch of in-betweens. Now unless you refurbish or build vans and cars for a living you definitely want to consider getting one that's in good condition and having the essential things that you need like a kitchenette, a bathroom, and a decent sleeping area. So what about some of the less obvious ones? Yeah, no, that's a good idea. And actually one that comes to mind is make sure your van has very good insulation. Yes. And you might think, hey, I don't go into the really cold weather, so I don't really need it. But insulation helps you both in the cold weather, but also in the really hot weather too. It helps moderate the temperature inside your RV or van. Absolutely. And let's not forget about comfortability, y'all. You need to make sure you have a good Good mattress yes. because if you don't have a good mattress you're not going to enjoy the process you know you're doing a lot of driving on the road and you're going to be sleeping in your van and RV so it's important to have that comfortable night's sleep so that you can wake up and have a great cup of coffee for the love of your life versus <laughs> Invest in a good mattress. <laughs> oh, and one thing we really appreciate having, you guys, is a water filtration system. A good water filtration system, right? Oh, no, that is so important. Obviously, you need pure drinking water when you're on the road. And you don't want to just constantly rely on just getting the plastic bottles. Oh, my gosh. Right? So make sure you have a good water filtration system. Now, what we have is actually a Berkey mm -hmm. we've been very happy with. And it works very well for us on the road. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like it's quadruple filtered. It goes from the outside yes. filter to the sink is filtered from the sink filter to the Berkey to the Berkey then to my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're interested, we can leave a link for that in the description box below. Learn about van maintenance and start becoming handy. If you're not handy, you need to get handy when you're living in a camper van because quite <laughs> frankly, something is always broken, oh, yeah. right? You're never, you're basically driving your house down the road and something tends to break when you're driving. We can't think of a time when everything has worked. And so it's very important to be able to fix things yourself. And that's not just doing the oil changes, not just, you know, doing the tire rotations, but it's really fixing things in your home. Like it could be the AC, it could be a water leak, uh, it could be the refrigerator. Make sure you read the manuals and start to become handy. Woo, that's right. Get handy, you guys, so you can avoid some of them crazy expensive techs. Create a budget. Living in a camper van can be affordable, but you still need to create a budget to manage your expenses. You know, van lifers and RVers alike that are living this lifestyle can certainly live cheaply, but there are a lot of times that it can be more expensive than you think. We actually put a video together on this right here, sharing what it was like living full time one year in our RV and what those costs are like and we'll leave a link in the description box below if you're interested. Practice minimalism. Living in a camper van means you'll need to embrace just that. Learn to live with less and enjoy the simple things in life. Less. <laughs> That's right. Less. More. <laughs> 
Now, one of the minimalistic things you can practice right now before you buy your camper van is to pack light. Start yeah. packing light. <laughs> yeah. No, that's absolutely true. We actually learned this ourselves. I mean, I personally packed way too much. We learned initially. hard way out. Exactly. And so you don't need so much stuff when you're living in the van. So definitely conserve the space and pack light. You need to always keep in mind the storage and the organization. You know, the biggest thing for us living in such a small space was keeping things neat and tidy, storage, as well as keeping things organized because it helps you keep a long lasting relationship, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very true. And space is at a premium, right? So you can't take everything that you can have in your normal house yeah right so everything's a trade-off do you take this do you take that can you take the fire pit can you take this propane burner something's got to give right you have limited space yeah can you take these pair of shoes or can you take these flip-flops or can yeah. you take this skirt or can you take this pair of pants that's a convertible he has a lot of trade-offs and you got to learn to sometimes wear the same thing twice but you, Dave has a method for that right what's the usual method oh for... here we go again what's the oh, oh. This one's fine. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> now, one of the big things for us living in a small camper van the way we do is we love to boondock. And what that means, you got to think about your water consumption. So learn to conserve water. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're basically bringing your water with you. So you can't take those long showers. No, right? you can't. Take the quick showers, get yourself clean. You know what's important. Three minutes or less is the best. <laughs> <laughs> learn to cook, honey. Yes, learn to cook. Now, Mama T loves to cook, right? Oh yeah, and I love to eat. And oh, he does love to eat. And that's what makes a fantastic loving relationship, right? You can, oh yeah. Ooh, ooh. Hold on guys, we'll be right back. <laughs> Woo, okay. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back to cooking, but we need to start cooking in the kitchen. So cooking is definitely an essential skill you need to learn. You know, you can't eat out all the time. So go ahead and get yourself some silverware, some good cookware, and start learning some simple recipes. As a matter of fact, I have a really good recipe for you in this video right here. And it's enough to last you for a week. Mm. And be prepared to cook outside. That's right. You know, it could be in a nice grill or even an induction cooktop. Yeah, we actually have a very, very good grill, Dave. We've been using it for over a year now, religiously. Yes. And every time I go to the store, I always buy something to throw on that grill because this is the grill master right here. Ooh, when he puts on a steak or he puts on some barbecue chicken, it's yum, yum. Give me some. Be flexible. Living in a camper van means you'll need to be flexible with your plans. You may not always know where you're going to be in a couple of weeks or even next week. We don't. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, we do. Sometimes. Normally. <laughs> right, but you definitely need that flexibility and be prepared to change your plans if necessary. And actually, weather could really have an impact on that as well. We've had situations where we've actually had tornado warnings affect our plans. Yeah, we had to stop, drop, and roll. And then we end up in some situations that you can't get out of. So it looked a little something like this in Deadwood. You remember that? Oh, man. Stay connected and get involved with the van life and RV community. You know, staying connected to the outside world is important. If you go off, let's say you're a solo van lifer and you're off out in a boonie somewhere, well, you need to make sure you have some form of connectivity in case something happens to you out there. Dave and myself, as full-time content creators, it's important for us to have connectivity all the time so we can be connected with you. So we've invested in hotspots and other internet connectivity ways to stay connected to the world out there. <laughs> <laughs> now that's very important. And also consider joining an online community, actually online or in person. There's yes. some great van life communities out there. We actually joined one related to our own Winnebago Echo here. Mm -hmm. And it's, you learn the great tips about the rig, places to go, things to do, and also just making friends. Absolutely. Hey, take a second if you haven't done so, by the way, go ahead, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so that you continue getting some of the best travel, RV and van life content out there. <laughs> Stay active. <laughs> <laughs> Living in a camper van can be surprisingly sedentary, oh, yeah. especially if you're on the road often. Definitely. And it's one of those things where you need to get that exercise in yes. there. You know, go for a bike ride, go for a walk, go for a hike. You know, some of the places we've been to because we're so consumed with work, we haven't had a chance to just get out and enjoy. And we're learning to do more and more of that, which goes to my next point. Take your time, if you can, going from place to place. You don't want to miss the in-betweens just because you're rushing to the next spot. And we've learned that over a year of full-time living in this and traveling to slow down a bit exactly. and enjoy it. Exactly. Slow down. Don't try to travel too far day after day after day. Take your time and just enjoy where you are. Yeah. Uh, we try and do what? Four hours at the max? Mr. Planner, just keep it within four hours. Anything yeah. longer might get you in trouble. Yeah. Until tomorrow. <laughs> And finally, and this is really important, so grab a piece of paper right now or post it 
write this down, stick it on your refrigerator or somewhere where it can be seen every day. Enjoy the journey. Seriously, enjoy the journey. Yeah, that's right. Living in a camper van can be a life-changing experience, so embrace it and enjoy the ride. I am. <laughs> Are you thinking of buying a camper van or RV for living the RV life? Well, it's a great idea, right, Dan? Absolutely. Yes, a camper van can be a fantastic way to explore the world. However, buying a camper van or RV can be a huge investment. It's really important to avoid some common buy mistakes that can turn your dream into a nightmare. <laughs> In this video, we're giving you nine pitfalls and mistakes to seriously avoid before you go out buying your camper van. Let's get into it. It's time to pick up Dave, baby. Oh, come on, honey. <laughs> Mama's coming to get you. Oh, there's my baby. Oh, there he is. Oh, he's ready. Hey, doll face. Ooh, you got the you got the right green thumb over there. Finally, someone's picking me up. You got. Uh, hey, that would be me. Get on in, baby. Let's we got it. a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's kick this off. Number one not doing enough research. In other words, don't rush your buying decision. Before you buy your camper van or RV, it's essential to do your research. Make sure you know what kind of van you want, what kind of budget you have, what really your needs are, Yes. right? And there's pros and cons to every type of RV or van from the different sizes, the space requirements, you know, can I go off road, all those kind of things. So you gotta really know what your needs are to Absolutely. begin with. Absolutely, and you're exactly, the needs are the most important. Are you gonna be a boondock? Are you gonna enjoy like real Really off-grid overlanding, getting your RV up on three wheel kind of trips. Yes, that's <laughs> it's right. It's all gonna depend on your needs. And like Tanya said, don't rush your buying decisions. Visit RV dealerships, visit RV shows, yes. right? Try some different ones. We actually rented a number of different types of RVs and vans to figure out kind of what we wanted, what was important to us. And you should do that as well. And just a quick related point, don't ignore your RV budget. I mean, things can get quickly out of hand when you see an RV from fully loaded to certain features, but know exactly what you can afford and stick with it. Next up, buying based on price alone. You know, while it's tempting to go out there and buy the cheapest camper van you can find so you can get out there and hit the road right now, well, that is often a huge mistake. A lot of these super cheap camper vans are poorly maintained, there's hidden issues, and the moral of the story is, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to repair a lot of those issues. Instead, focus on a good quality van that meets your needs and your budget. You know, do your research. That would be the biggest suggestion we can offer you. Look up the RV brand or brands you're interested in. Look for reviews from former RV owners that may have owned a brand that you're interested in. And definitely check for the manufacturer's quality and reliability. That's a really good point. And it's also true about RV dealers. Mm -hmm. Don't necessarily buy from the RV dealer offering the cheapest price. I know you'd normally say, oh, you got to do that. Yeah. But the quality of RV service, right, and repairs is very important. So you want to make sure you buy from an RV dealer that offers good service to you as well because in any new rig in particular, you're gonna have issues that come up with it and need that warranty repairs, Absolutely. right? And actually something that we did, a mistake that we made and we wouldn't do again, we actually bought from an RV dealer that was like halfway far across away, the country. Right? Far, far away. <laughs> exactly, so they might have a great repair service, but that doesn't, ma the that doesn't matter when you're like 1500 miles away, right? So if we were to do it again, we would buy locally from an RV dealer that has an excellent reputation for service. Yeah. Yeah. Now, would I would I buy it from a place that's far away? Well, if it came with some red ruby slippers and I could say, there's no place like repair. There's, there's no, no place like home. There's no place like repair. And I could fly right there? Maybe I would. I like how she thinks. <laughs> not checking the vehicle's history. If you're looking at a used camper van, it's really important to check the vehicle history of any camper van you're looking at buying. This will give you an idea of what accidents or damage happened to this camper van, as well as what repair or maintenance has taken place on it. Don't rely on the seller representation 100% do your own research. Not getting a pre-purchase RV inspection. Now this one's a big one. Yeah, it really is. Right. Before you buy your camper van or RV, it's essential that you get your camper van inspected by a qualified RV inspector that you hire. Don't rely on the seller or you know the dealer, certainly, for any mechanic they may have look at it. They obviously have a vested interest to sell you that 
have your own person do the research and they can go through it. Keep in mind, it's your home. They will go through it, give you a list of anything wrong with it and an estimate to repair those items. Yeah, and it can apply to both new and used, yes. especially used. Now, we got a brand new one. We didn't hire one, I wish we did. You know, certain dealerships have a certain inspection point system that they put in place and it doesn't always catch everything. Yes. But if you hired your own inspector, it might find some of those crucial things that you could have addressed before taking ownership of your RV, which in the long run can save you a lot of time and money. Yes, it's a little investment for the inspector, but it's really worth it up front that'll save you headaches later on. Oh, I forgot to mention something. Oh yeah? Yes, we have an awesome private community called our Turn to World Insiders, AKA Game Changers over on Patreon, where you get behind the scenes content, exclusive access to merch early before it's launched, and we have some new designs coming, as well as private videos, live Ooh. streams, and possible meetups. And you can find that all in the link in the description box below, patreon.com forward slash turn it up world. It really is, it's a great and growing community. It really is. Not considering the size and weight of the camper van. Now camper vans obviously come in different sizes and weights, yeah. right? And it's important to understand how these different sizes will affect both your driving experience and your living experience, right? Yes. Right, so I mean, we, we have a small rig and we actually enjoy getting into small spaces. Now, if you have a large rig, you may not be able to get into the same spaces, but at yeah. the same time, you also have a lot more space to live in. So it's constantly a trade-off yeah. and you really need to understand that and also you know, understand what's important to you ultimately. Absolutely, and if you have a small rig, you may not be able to take all the essentials you really want to take with you. So 100% right, take all all those factors into consideration and get out there and try it before you buy it. Not testing the camper van. So this leads us into the next point, which is try it before you buy it. Get out there and test drive it. I mean, this will obviously give you an idea of how it handles and perhaps any mechanical issues it might have. Pay attention to the steering, the braking, the acceleration. How are you handling its comfortability while you're driving it? Wind, is wind a factor? You know, these are really important factors in terms of trying it before you buy it, because if you don't, you might have to live with that decision. And on a related point, don't buy sight unseen, right? In a competitive market, especially the last few years, it's been kind of crazy, and people just jump in there and buy things online, not necessarily seeing, but you're taking a big risk. Make yes. sure you see the camper van in person to get that inspection done, really make sure you're comfortable with what you're buying. Mm, I don't touch it. Let me touch it before I buy it. Yes. Oh, it feels good in my hands. That feel the wind? Is it blowing your hair, Dave? I'm feeling it. Oh, you feel the wind? Yeah, hold on, hold, hold on. on. Strap down. There it is. Is that Strap the right? Down. This is definitely the right one for us. Not considering your camping style. Different camper vans are designed for different camping styles. For example, if you plan to do a lot of off-road camping, you probably want to get a rig that is four by four or at least all wheel drive and made with high clearance to get to those remote places. Now, if you're gonna be doing more urban camping, you may want a smaller van, maybe stealthier van, you can kind of fit into those tight spots. Yeah, and you also should take into consideration, do you plan to do more RV campgrounds uh, or resorts with full hookups? You know, that's a really important factor. Or are you gonna plan to do more boondocking? You know, things like, are you gonna be in cold weather a lot or hot weather? A lot of those things are factors taken into consideration, especially that because it affects your generator, it affects your solar, it affects your lithium batteries, right. and, and really affects how you're going to live your lifestyle in your RV. So keep that in mind. Not thinking about storage. You know, storage can be a big issue in a camper van, especially if you're traveling with multiple people, you have pets, if you're living in your RV, or even if you have a lot of gear. So it's really important to know how much storage you're going to need and how you plan to organize your belongings. And storage was an important consideration for us. Yes, it was. When we bought our camper van, we found that this van actually had the right amount of storage for us. We initially had thought about getting a, cl a true class B. It's smaller. Right, small class B van, but there was very limited storage. And so you need to find that perfect balance. It's also a trade-off between size of the rig and storage, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to get smaller, you lose the storage. You got to find that right balance. Not planning for maintenance and repairs. Like any vehicle, camper vans require regular maintenance and repairs. So you need to be prepared for that. Make sure you budget for that. Make sure you actually are prepared to allocate the time for that too. And also how easy or hard it might be to find a qualified mechanic to actually do the work. Yeah, I think Dave is absolutely right. And one important thing to tie into that when it comes to expenses, I would always say have an emergency fund. You know, if you can yeah. tuck a couple dollars here and there, before you know it, you have enough to handle the repair without deciding where the money's gonna come from. You know, as we stated earlier, if you're buying an RV 
new or used from a dealership, well, make sure that RV dealership has a strong reputation for service, maintenance, and warranty repair. You know, this is your home on wheels. All RVs are gonna have issues especially homes on wheels riding down the street a lot of bumps and shakes things come loose it's just the way it is Ooh, we, got, we got some bonuses <laughs> bonus number one not considering fuel efficiency camper vans can be very expensive to fuel especially Ooh, if you plan yes. to do a lot of driving so you just need to make sure you factor that into your budget and also in consideration sort of what you plan to buy right maybe you don't want that massive you know, gas guzzler out there getting like four miles to the gallon. Maybe you kind of get something a little bit smaller. If you're going to do a lot of driving and you don't have the budget for the massive fuel costs. Yeah, and especially at the time of this video, the way gas prices and diesel keeps fluctuating, you better have that budget ready. Bonus number two, not thinking about resale value. Now, of course, all camper vans will depreciate in value over time, but it's still important to consider the resale value of any rig you buy. And some higher quality ones may retain their value better over the long run, it may ultimately be a better investment. Yes. You know, the most important thing is to remember this. It's not just a vehicle for most of us. It's your home on wheels. Yeah. It's about nine feet, right? No, we're like 12 feet. No, nah, no, nah, nah, I'm pretty sure we're nine feet high. No, we can't go through that. No, this is 10 six. We can do no, it. No, we're we like 12 feet. No! Hey, what's up, you guys? For those of you that are new here, we are Tanya and Dave from Turn It Up World. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. As RV newbies, there are some mistakes we wish we knew to avoid so we wouldn't have to make them. So today we're gonna to talk about avoiding these RV mistakes, especially if you're a newbie. Right, so if you're a newbie, definitely stay tuned and watch this video and don't make the mistakes that we made. Yeah, it'll certainly save you a lot of stress and some extra gray hairs. <laughs> Hey, first and foremost, and probably one of the most important to us anyway, is don't go buying a brand new RV thinking that it's like a brand new car. There are gonna be issues right off the bat. It just happens to be that way. You know, this is like a house on wheels. So if you ever owned a house or you lived in a house, you know there's always something coming up. Well, this is a moving house and it jiggles and it wiggles and it shakes and it bakes and it jiggles and it wiggles and it shakes and it bakes. So things are always coming loose in there. Now we, actually on our second day traveling home with our boy desert snow we had some heat issues in the freezing cold in Vail. Dave you remember that? Oh I do. Ooh. We got this error message and we're newbies here guys and so we're trying to learn right, this. But so the error message is W278 yeah. which is? Yeah it says the potential cause warm air outlets blocked, circulated air intake blocked, or EN end outlet closed. Now we've opened up all of those things. So as you can see there, don't expect a brand new RV to not have its fair share of issues. Things happen all the time. So if you go in knowing this, you'll have a little bit less stress when it does happen. But make sure you get a good warranty because you will need to get those things fixed. Just, just say, it's a hot out here. You gotta stay hydrated with a- Some alcohol? Alcohol. It's always good for that. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, do not forget about the dear old awning. Never leave your RV's awning out. I mean, if you're going for a hike or a walk and it's quiet as a whistle, not a drop of wind in the air, do not leave it out because Mother Nature can be very moody and she can snatch that off at a drop of a dime. Even the ones that are automatically to go in, if it's a strong enough wind current before, can it actually retract? Bye-bye. Like Amen a sail to that. in the wind. Amen to that. Like a sail in the wind. Well, actually, what I heard, babe, is that RV park dumpsters are littered with the remains of broken awnings, <laughs> right? So true. that's from an RV veteran. I don't know if it's true, or they kind of drape it across the top <laughs> and then drive on. You kind of yeah, strap it down and hit the road. Now, if you could totally relate to that, go ahead and smash that thumbs up. Wow, the sun is shining, but it is getting hot. I want to put the awning out. Okay, really out here. I gotta to the other side and tell them to put, not put the awning out. Dave, don't do it! No! Do what? This next mistake to avoid is don't overpack. Keep in mind, you're in a basically a tiny home here, not a lot of space, unless you have a humongo RV, yeah. which we don't have. Yeah. But uh, pack lightly. Like, you don't need as much stuff as you think. No, not at right? all. I mean, hey, fellas, 
Okay, it's not just the ladies, but fellas, keep those extra shoes at home. You don't need them. You just don't. <laughs> Get a nice pair of comfortable flip-flops, some sneakers, and a nice pair of dress shoes if you're going out to dinner. I agree. That's all you need. Pack light and stay organized. <laughs> and fellas, speaking of the shoes, take the darn shoes off before you go into the RV because uh, it's a small space. You can get a lot of mud in there. And you want to keep your baby happy. So happy wife, happy life. Yeah, take them off until that point. If you're going to leave them outside, have a little sort of Tupperware kind of container that, or a little basket you can kind of put them in and seal it on top, especially if you're going to be staying in like, you know, Arizona or Nevada or places where there's like scorpions that tend to like to crawl into your shoes because that will not feel great. <laughs> exactly. Don't do what I do and just kind of keep them off all the time. Oh, pad. don't put your feet in front of people's faces. So this is probably a really good point to let everyone know that we are going to be going on a very big road trip very soon. No, it's going to be awesome. I'm totally psyched about it. I know. Cross country. Cross Can't wait. country. Right? Hey, and we should probably mention, if you haven't done so, take a second, sign up to our newsletter at turnitupworld.com forward slash newsletter. We'll leave all that information right there somewhere on the screen and even in the description box below because we may be coming to a city near them. Yes. Right? If and if you're new to the channel or have not yet subscribed, please do so. We would really appreciate it. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Absolutely. Now, the first thing you need to do before you drive off the RV lot is know the height of your RV. Absolutely critical. If you have to measure it, go out and measure it. And keep in mind, too, you may have a roof rack, may have some things on top of the roof. So measure those as well because you don't want to go through or go under a bridge and knock some things off. Just like we did. Hey, babe, we're uh, nine feet, right? No, we're like... 12 feet. 11, no, 12 no, feet. no, I'm pretty sure we're nine feet high. No, we can't go through that. No, this says 10 6. We can do no, it. No, we're we like 12 feet. No! See? I told you. Fuck! And also take your time when you're filling up your water or draining your water system. Now, one nice thing about that is that the compartments come, at least in our RV, come with nice kind of a diagram to show you which way the valves should be situated. So make sure you do that, be careful, follow the diagrams, have that double check before you either fill up your tank or empty it out. And we also- We always check each other on that exactly, one. Exactly, so we, we do. do. Double check yeah. system. Yeah, and we also recommend too, if you're filling up your water, use a filtration system. You don't know all the stuff coming in from the RV park. So we actually use this as we fill our tanks and also use a little pressure system here that helps moderate the pressure going into your pipes and your tank. Important to have that regulator. Exactly. One thing we want to mention that you should not avoid, uh, and some of them may already be equipped with them, but ones like these or the B-classes or others may not have a surge protector built into it. So definitely get yourself a surge protector. I mean, there might be an instance where something does happen and it can be a costly mistake not to have one. So invest in a good surge protector. The other thing we highly recommend is this right here. Okay, this is a unique sort of system, but don't rely on just your intuition about the propane tank levels. Get a propane tank monitoring system. They're very easy to install. Dave installed it within like a few seconds and there's an app that you can actually download to monitor your propane levels, which is very, very, very important, especially in the winter months, things like that when you rely on that propane for your heat. So this one is really important. So mark this down as an important note to make. Show some courtesy to your neighbors. If you're parked in an RV spot, imagine this for the next several days, however long you're gonna be there, that this is your home. Front yard, backyard, side yard. How would you feel if someone walked their dog across your space, took a piss, and walked on, or decided to just say, hey, we're gonna blast some loud music like this? What? What the heck is that? What is going on out there? Oh. Gosh, it's like midnight. Jeez. All right, do not avoid this. As soon as you get your RV, take whatever opportunity you have and read the manuals. We've been told this from numerous seasoned veteran RVers that those manuals should be read like the Bible because when something comes up, the more knowledge you have, the better you are prepared, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Of course, you won't remember everything in the no. manuals, <laughs> but you have manuals all. from all the systems basically in your RV. So read through those. So if something happens, you know, it may trigger a memory. You may go back and you know check the manual yeah. and find the issue and how to resolve it. Because I know like for me, for instance, I know I could read the manual and I won't remember anything yeah, exactly. I read until but something comes up. Like, wait, a like, yeah. wait a second. Wait a second. I remember.
remember. Exactly. I just don't remember what page it's on, but I remember it's in the manual. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, look at that. Oh my god, look at that. Is that a stream or an air? Because it's, it's half. <laughs> It's have an like air. half an airstream. It's an air. Ooh, the wind is starting to pick up. A little <laughs> bit, a little bit. In my eyes. Well, I will say this. One thing we always do before we head off on a road trip is pack whatever essential food-wise that we need. We try to get our water, our snacks, whatever things we think we're going to need before hitting the road because there might be times that you get into some situation and you get to whatever destination you need to get to pretty late and there's nothing along the way. And one thing you do not want to have is that low blood sugar. Kicking them, right? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, it's not talking about. pretty. All right, so cut it. I'll try and do what you said. So cut it. Back up to three. Don't turn yet. All right, I'll go straight. Now turn. Now turn. Turn. turning. There you go. Turn out the other way. Oh. The wheel, the other way. Jeez Louise! Turn the wheel a little bit more Keep turning. Oh my gosh! Ay, ay, ay! Well, we did it! Time for a drink! Now this next point is important for all our viewers and especially RV newbies who may not be used to it. When, you're, uh, when you get your RV, you're driving a lot of weight around and so you need to make sure that your tire pressure is at the accurate level. And so check your manual, know what that tire pressure is. You may actually have a tire pressure gauge system in your RV itself monitoring that. But if you don't, or actually regardless, make sure you have your own tire pressure gauge. And we have the Merlin digital pressure gauge, which we find works pretty well. And uh, before every trip, make sure you check that pressure. If it's not right, definitely get it to the right pressure amount. Yeah, and if you're interested in, in that Merlin, we do have a Amazon store. You can check that out as well. Links in the description box below. Now, can I just say how Awesome, you look in that Turn It Up World's Bear jersey. Well, thank you, babe. Doesn't it look great? It looks great, but you're looking pretty fine in that Star Wars Rise of Resistance. I oh, think we... the pass holder shirt. Sure do, do you, want, do you want, want this one? Do you want to do a swap? I do not. T shirt swap. It's too hot. T shirt too swap. Hot. Too hot. <laughs> but you can pick those up in our Turn It Up World merch store. Shoot myself promotion. <laughs> hey, so give yourself enough time to get packed up and moved on. Do not rush because that's mistakes can happen. Oh man, that was the fastest ever. I know, I timed you. You were like two minutes. Two minutes, high two five. Minutes, high fastest five. Ever. We're, we're late, we're we gotta go. go. Let's late. go. We're late, we're late, we're late, Let's we're do late. It. Let's go. Now that can be a costly mistake. And last, but certainly not least, oof, just enjoy the RV life, right? Absolutely. Babe, Yeah. we have another big problem. Oh, not again. You know, RV life isn't always moonlight and sunflowers, y'all, especially if you're living in your RV full time. Now, we have been RV living full time in our small camper van for over a year now, and it doesn't come with its share of ups and downs. So today we're going to share with you the true downside of full time RV living that a lot of RVers probably don't talk about. Okay. Oh, oh can you wait? Oh, 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 I'm trying to get lunch ready. David, gosh, you know what? You can make your own lunch today. You know, living in a tiny space or even living in a big RV, if you're living in it full time, can really test you and your partner's patience with each other. As a matter of fact, it can even test your relationship. Yeah, I know, it's very true. We're all around each other all the time. Wait, wait, wait. Which is a good all thing. All the time. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good thing. Yeah. But I mean, exactly. There's no space to get away. Maybe you go off for a walk or something yeah. or things like that. But we're together, of course, pretty much all the time yeah. living in a 23 foot home. Yeah. And if you're literally, if you're trying to air out your dirty laundry, well, <laughs> yeah. Another downside of RV life full time, very different from the relationship is that we can't think of a time when everything in our RV worked. Yeah. RV repairs seem endless, right? You're basically driving your house down the road. It's bumpy, it's creaking, the weather's changing. So things are gonna go wrong. Yeah, we currently have a long list of repairs that are needed 
right now but we also live in the rv so we have to pick and choose our times and when we can get those repairs done now here's an example today as you're watching this video we actually have a water leak we Woo -hoo! the third it's one third, third one we've had already so we're getting a little bit more confident uh we're assessing the issues we're actually determining where the leak is coming from so that's a side note you know one of the tips i can actually give to you as folks watching us that may be new into the rv space is you're under warranty so if you're under warranty maybe right before it expires contact your service provider and let them know air out that dirty laundry what issues you are having because today a lot of times it's hard to get into a service center to get that repair done right away because they're so overwhelmed or backlog so keep a good record of that so this way when you do have to go get your repair done it shouldn't be a problem taking care of it even after your warranty is expired as long as you got it in before the end of your warranty right that's a good tip and when you finally do get your rig repaired well that's your home right so you sometimes have to actually find a place to live yeah so where are you gonna live well that's a great question and we've actually had this happen to us you know we had to get our rv repaired we were in amish country and we needed to find a place to stay so fortunately there's airbnb the unfortunate side is a lot of these airbnbs don't allow pets we have two cats and that's even worse than dogs at times because they some of them may take dogs but they won't take cats Hi, Mises. Oh, perfect uh, timing. Perfect timing. Oh, perfect is. timing. But they won't take cats, right, Mimi? Hey, well, they won't buddy. take you. But this one place, say hello to everybody. Oh, she says, you'll find me more on Patreon. <laughs> See you over there. Bye. She's like, let me go. <laughs> Um, but we did find a place out in Amish country that allowed us to stay out there for several nights until we actually were able to get our RV repaired and they allowed cats. So that's something to really think about, especially if you're traveling in an RV and you're living in it with pets. So another downside to living full time in an RV is that lack of privacy, especially if you're on a campground. Yeah, no, speaking of kind of moonshots, oh. you don't want to get moonshots in the uh, middle of the night. Make sure you pull up your shades, yeah, right? Because those RV parks would be pretty tight. Moonshots, ladies, you know, <laughs> moon, frontal moonshots. Frontal moon. You know, it's it could be one of those things where it doesn't allow you to have a lot of privacy, so close those shades. Unless it's your thing. To moonshine everybody. <laughs> yeah, your thing. <laughs> All right, so this next one, I'm going to let you take this one. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. Well, this one really pertains to me. Don't let things get messy. I tend to, I'm not the cleanest guy. I, I get th things get a little messy, right? But in a small space, you gotta really make sure you put your things away, like fold the clothes, get them back in the drawers and things like that because things get out of hand pretty quickly. Yeah. So speaking of messy, you know, no matter what size rig you have, big or small, eventually at some point we always feel there's not enough storage. So what comes with that is we need to make sure the compartments that we do have, we're packing them smartly, almost like a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, no, that's very true. Especially when I think about the outside garage space, oh, right? Yeah. That is, I try to have like the more frequently used items closer to the door, the ones we don't use so much, further away and tougher to access. Yeah, but sometimes things like this happen. Hey Dave, can you grab the small printer? I gotta print out a couple of projects for today. Printer? Oh man, that's way in there, babe. That's gonna take like 30 minutes to get to. 30 minutes? What? Uh, who told you to put a weight on there anyway? <laughs> My God. Now, for us, living in a small camper van, the downside is having a small kitchen. That means a smaller space to prep with, um, to cook when. So for us, it really does come down to getting really creative in the kitchen. And that even applies for grocery store shopping because we have a decent sized refrigerator, but it still requires a lot of puzzling to think about what we're going to pack for the next trip or next adventure. Um, so it's a lot more prep work. Yeah, and Tanya, I gotta say, Tanya does an amazing job. She's super creative in the kitchen, and that's with no oven, not even a convection oven, right? We just have a basic small microwave, mm -hmm. right? And then, of course, our burners and induction cooktop, yeah. but you do an amazing job, babe. Thank you. Creativity, y'all. Keeps your man happy. <laughs> Since we live in a small camper van, we don't have a tow behind or a small car to kind of head off into town with. And so for us, if we're going to a restaurant or something in town or a show, we need to pack up our home and kind of take it in. And that can be a real hassle. Yeah, I mean, there's also times where we do try to get close enough to places where we can just pop off the bikes and just ride them on into town. But there's also times when you have those bikes and we're in town that we got caught in a hailstorm or a rainstorm right. or some kind of storm, which you shouldn't be riding a bike out in. But, you know, things like that happen. So it's really smart to uh, get yourself a car. 
<laughs> hey, quick question for you. If you stay in RV campgrounds or RV parks, have you seen an increase in rate or monthly rates in some of your favorite RV campgrounds? Let us know in the comments below. Now with current rising costs everywhere, you know, RV parks and RV campgrounds have become pretty expensive, especially during peak seasons and around tourist areas. An example, we're in a very popular RV campground. We have a monthly here, but they recently increased their fees $200, a 30% increase just like that. So with that being said, we actually put together a really great video on the true cost of RV living. So if you're interested in checking that out, we'll leave a link in the description box below. When you're living in an RV full time, you really need to pay close attention to your utilities. Oh, yeah. Meaning like if you have propane for the heat, you know, what are your propane levels? Or if you have a cassette toilet or a black tank, what are those levels? Like when you need to dump those, very important. I mean, we go winter camping quite a bit and we rely on propane for our heat. If we were to run out of that, that would be crazy. Absolutely, and we enjoy boondocking. So if you're a boondocker and you enjoy those, that's where you really want to pay attention to the levels on all levels. Yes. <laughs> and if you have kitties, make sure you stay on top of the kitty litter because in a small RV or van, those smells can pick up pretty quick. Speaking of living with cats, woo, we, you, know, you know, when your cats have to go, they have to go. And I think one just went. Yeah, exactly. Make sure you clean the litter quickly. You know, driving in bad weather can be really scary. We have had many examples of us driving in bad weather. And sometimes you can't help it because you're staying in one spot. Then you're actually, you have to move from that spot. And the day you have to move is the day that there's going to be bad weather. So, yeah, sometimes it's uh, not an easy thing to avoid, but it can be really scary. I don't know what you're talking about. I never have those white knuckles driving down the high wind roads. Mm. No. We should play a clip of that. The visibility is kind of tough here. No, it really is. And you can feel the rig kind of shaking from the wind whipping across. I know, there. I it's, feel it it's... too. Yeah, he's got to beat off the ice. And we still have another five miles to go. Woo, this is great. Speaking of weather, it can be really hard to maintain a decent temperature in your rig, especially in an extreme cold or hot weather, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. If you think about extreme heat, your AC in your rig will be working really hard to try to maintain just decent temperature because a lot of these rigs aren't insulated really all that well. Exactly. And speaking to that, we were just in really cold temperatures, the coldest we've ever been. Uh, the temperatures reached down to negative nine degrees Fahrenheit, AKA negative 23 degrees Celsius. But it was actually very cold and hard to really maintain the temperatures in our rigs. We even had icy patches. You know what? Let me not talk about that. You should go check out that video because it's kind of fun. Humidity and condensation inside your RV is another big issue in full-time RV life. Oh, it really is. Actually, one of the solutions we've done, um, and a lot of you asked us in previous videos what we do to avoid that humidity, it's quite simple. So our max fan, we tend to crack it just enough um, to let air flow out. And we also have a small dehumidifier, which in our opinion is a lifesaver, especially if you are in true humid light conditions. Now we mentioned before that you need to get used to things breaking in your RV because it just happens. Mm -hmm. But what we didn't mention is that RV maintenance is very expensive and time consuming. And that's definitely a downside of RV life. Absolutely. I think the moral of that story is, and we mentioned this earlier, is start getting handy. If you're gonna be in the RV space, it's really important to start, start to learn sounds of your RV, start to learn if things break, how to repair those things. There are a lot of amazing folks in this RV community that are willing to help you out. You know, just pop up in the front of your hood. Someone will come run it over and help yes. <laughs> So it's really kind of a crucial thing to learn how to fix uh, your RV so that you're not spending 80% of the time in the shop. I mean, the, the purpose of the RV life is to get out and enjoy it. So get out and enjoy it. So for us, it is really important since we're constantly content creating and trying to upload videos, internet and cell service is crucial. Yes. So that doesn't always happen. I mean, I know there's apps for, you know, where you can find spots that may have service, but that is unpredictable and unreliable at times, right? Yeah, especially if you're going away from populated areas or boondocking, we'll be in areas where you got nothing. Yeah. Right, so just be prepared for very intermittent cell and, uh, and internet service. Absolutely. And one of the things we've invested in, and I'm sure a lot of you already know this, is Starlink. And for us, it works 
phenomenal. It has its moments, like everything yeah. else is moody, but at the same time, it allows us to be able to access data and internet service um, when we need to, especially in those hard conditions. Now I have to phrase it like this. A big downside is it could be isolating. It really can be like you'll be at a campground or at a boondocking spot or a uh, a city park or wherever it might be for a couple of days you meet some wonderful folks and then you're you're gone yeah everyone kind of heads their own direction you hope that in the future you kind of meet up again with your newfound friends but it's kind of hard to kind of maintain those relationships yeah, sometimes yeah maybe at some point we'll see you guys on the road maybe we could do some caravanning and really have a party you ready for this babe are you sure you're ready for this? I am ready. I, I know we're both ready for this. We get this question asked all the time. How do y'all live in such a tiny space on wheels? And so today we figured the best way to do that is to share nine of our most embarrassing things we do living in our camper van full time. All right, so let's start airing out some of this dirty laundry. Pun intended. All right, number one, let's talk about the clothing situation. Now, in a small space for us, every inch counts, and that means even what you're bringing to wear. And so for us, sometimes we tend to wear some of the same things over and over. And you might have noticed that in some of the videos we put out. But the best way for us to determine whether we can wear it again is what, babe? Well. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a pass. Now we wear a lot of comfortable clothing and layers as well. We we'll tend to also buy things that are like airwick, um, t-shirts that have a lot more breathing room so you don't, even if you're going into a little bit more humid environments, they dry fast, they're easy to wash by hand. Um, and I actually bought Dave and myself a couple of pants that convert into yes. shorts. And so they're convertibles. I like my convertibles. And it's a great way to be able to rock multiple outfits. Right, like multi-use. Multi-use. Showering. Sh showering? Oh, people shower in their RVs? What, really? Oh, no, we actually do shower in the RV, but not as often because it's a small RV. No, no, it's true. We don't shower every day. We don't shower necessarily every other day either. Um, you know. Obviously, it sticks and bricks. We used to shower pretty much every day, right? Yeah. So it's very different living the van life. Absolutely. Now, we do what they call the baby wipe shower, which is amazing. It's like luxury sometimes. The baby wipe showers really come in handy. I, I find I do enjoy uh, a baby wipe shower. I sometimes change which one I want, either a lavender night or a cocoa butter. And regarding our shower, we boondock quite a bit. And when we're boondocking, we actually don't shower as frequently as we would. And that's really because we're trying to conserve our water. We have a 50 gallon tank and we're using that water for everything, right? So you don't really use that all in the shower. And it is a good a good size tank. It really is, 50 right? gallons. Right, but still we want to conserve that and also condensation build up inside. Worry about that a little bit. So let's talk about the toilet situation. Yes, the toilet situation. Now, for us in a small RV, it's an amazing bathroom. Anything, if you know anything about the Winnebago Echo, that bathroom is such a unique spin. It's one of the coolest features in this rig. We have a five gallon cassette toilet, which is essentially a five gallon black tank. And that is super small Tiny. in the RV community. And because of that, I need to empty it on a regular basis. And I don't always get to it as quickly as I should. So that sometimes we go into the night and I'm nervous. I have this nightmare of it actually overflowing, you know, God forbid. And so we may not be able to go to the bathroom at night sometimes, which is crazy. Yeah, unfortunately that has never happened. There has never been an overflowage, but there's things that we put in place so that we know if we're gonna be boondocking for a while so that we don't fill up our cassette toilet. Um, we have what I like to call my portable poop tent. Speaking of toilets, let's talk about an embarrassing dump moment. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah. talking about dumping of the tanks, y'all. Yes, exactly. <laughs> dumping the tanks. Now, we have to dump our gray water tank using the traditional hoses. And as you probably know, there's like three hooks on the attachment that comes up onto the drain. And sometimes, I've actually only gotten two a couple times by accident. And you don't want to do that because I got a little bit wet on that one. Which yeah, and he got... It was he, not pretty. He got a Hail Mary on that one because <laughs> it was a gray. Now, if it were black, I'm sure that would have been a hot mess. Yes. Oh, before we continue, Dave and I want to mention we have a really wonderful group over on Patreon called our Turn It Up World Insiders. It's a place for you to get to know us a little bit more intimately and us to get to know you. Uh, we do share things like exclusive behind the scenes merch, videos, live streams, and more. And what we'll do so that you learn more information about that, we'll leave it in the description box below. We would love to see you there. Yes.
So let's talk about secrets, or shall we say, no secrets. You know, there's a funny joke. It goes, behind every great man is a woman trying to get to the cabinets he's standing in front of. <laughs> and that is very true. As it relates to secrets in RV parks, I do have to admit, sometimes I'll convince myself that my boxers are shorts. If I have to run out and get something quickly, I will do that. Yeah, and I feel like sometimes when I'm not least thinking about it, the shades are down, I'd end up taking off, you know, trying to change into something a little bit more comfortable, and I'm just flashing the neighbors, you know, and sometimes they'll drive by slow or they're looking in this direction, and I have no concept that they might be staring at my cookies. <laughs> Time for bad odors inside our camper van. This is about to be really embarrassing, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> and the first topic, near dear to my heart, foot odors. <laughs> and truth be told, my feet stink pretty Woo! bad. Yeah, and I, <laughs> this is really embarrassing. I try to clean my feet with actually baby wipes and it's not all that effective. No, not at all. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe you can tell us some awesome solutions you may have in the comments below for those smelly feet. I think the solution I have is just burn everything. Burn those socks and those shoes. Start all over again. <laughs> exactly. And of course, and next up is of course, bad gas. Oh, right. You're talking 23 foot RV of just torture. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes Tiny will cook an amazing dinner. Thank God we have great ventilation, but sometimes, woo. So if you don't know, you'll know now, Dave and I, we travel with our two kitties, Brady and Bailey. And where they use the restroom, it's it's kind of interesting. We have their little box under our dinette table because, again, it's a small space. And you definitely know when they use the bathroom at first. We do keep a great job at keeping it clean. But sometimes, you know, even the cat's got to have little rice and beans. Let's talk about driving days. You know, Dave and I, we have our systems. Dave takes care of breaking down camp on the outside. I take care of things on the inside. And I'm sure we have all done this where you're in a rush to break down to get to the next spot and you don't close a cabinet or you forget to take down a picture or a painting. And we've had instances where right as we drive off, there's banging, there's rattling or things are just coming out crashing. Now we have gotten much better at this next one, I think, but that is really overestimating how far we can drive. Sometimes I don't look at the weather forecast, so I'm not factoring in, you know, the wind whipping the rig and really kind of slowing down and also other rigs going by and that kind of white knuckle driving. Yeah. Now, should we talk about uninvited guests? Yes, we definitely should. Now, I am sure we have all had an instance of uninvited guests and I'm talking about the four-legged, the eight-legged, um, you know, type creatures from mice to spiders. We've had an instance where we only fortunately only had one yes. mouse in here, but it was a big it mouse. It was big. It was a big mouse. Now we have two cats, so that mouse didn't stand a chance. <laughs> right. Now, but spiders are another story. We get spiders all the time all in our bedroom. All the time. And that kind of freaks us out. If we're camping, say, down in Texas or something, worried about, like, you know, the black widows. The recluses. The recluses. And we actually almost had a black widow in the rig. We did. All right. So we have this beautiful little bear. You guys may have seen it in some of our other videos. And I usually check the bear. I usually, when he's outside for a sense of amount of time, before he comes inside on our breakdown day, I usually check him. But again, rushing to get out of to a in. certain spot, we brought him in. And something, as we're I'm working through things here, triggered to say, I better check him. And I've turned a light onto him, and there, sure enough, was a black widow inside the bear. So we should talk about RV rookie mistakes. And one is forgetting the height of your RV. And we're, we've all been very good about the height of our RV and driving the highways and the bridge and the Bridges. things. Bridges. But we forget when we kind of go into cities and looking for parking, we don't really think about the tree branches. And I've more times than, many times, more times than not, I've actually gone into parking spaces and heard the scraping on the roof right from tree branches. Mm -hmm. And one embarrassing rookie mistake is ignoring unexplained noises coming from your rig. You're basically driving your home down the road. So you hear a noise, you need to know what it is while you're driving. And that actually happened to us. We were driving, heard a rattling on the roof. And I'm thinking, oh, it's probably fine. Maybe I turned up the radio a bit so you didn't hear the noise anymore. Exactly. Bad idea. But actually, as it turned out, our solar panels became unplugged. Yeah, and that goes 
to the next point of a rookie mistake is not knowing your systems. You know, had we checked our Xantrek system when things were being charged on the solar panels, we would have easily have known that we weren't getting enough charge to the batteries from the solar because it's night and day once we plug those up. So knowing your systems is really important and you won't have to go a month, two months, three months, maybe longer without solar power charging those batteries. So we should talk a bit about RV awnings. Yeah. Another little embarrassing episode Our there. embarrassing yes. episode with an awning. <laughs> exactly. So we left our awning out, not so worried. Uh, this is early on because we thought, okay, it has a wind sensor. It's going to automatically retract. So as the wind picked up, shouldn't be a problem. Well, that really wasn't the case. The wind picked up and the awning, it was going crazy, right, babe? And if it's we like were bouncing. not there to coach it back yeah. in, it would have ended up in the neighbor's front yard. I think that's right. <laughs> now, this is more Dave than myself, but we're both kind of mental about leaving the RV keys inside the rig when we're not inside the RV. So since Dave is always like the pocket friendly pants person, we give him the keys and he takes the keys out, puts them in his pocket when we're going outside of the rig when he's ever doing anything outside. But that comes with a price. <laughs> yes, it does. I, I stuff a lot of things in my pocket and I kind of, I forget my keys are in there. And I have set off the panic button like this is more midnight. times. It happens. It happens way too much, and yeah. I apologize for that. Yeah. And it takes me a long time. Then I have to find out like where is it first. I'm like, why is this thing going off? Then I realize I set it off. It's so embarrassing. And then I have all these pockets. I'm trying to find where the keys are. And it's so embarrassing because it could be like 12 o'clock oh, at horrible. midnight, one o'clock, and the fact that it goes off, he's waking up every oh, one of the terrible. neighbors. But you know, we are getting better at it. I'm in rehab. I'm working on it. <laughs> And finally, our camper van is not always neat and tidy, despite what you guys may see in our tour videos. Yes, we have a lot of clothes. We have a lot of camera equipment. We have two kitties and their litter. Yeah. Right, so quite often you'll see a few things on our beds. And I gotta admit too, I am not Mr. Neat and my closets can be pretty messy. Well, you know, in his defense, it's a tiny space. So if you have one shirt or one sock that's not folded, the entire place looks messy. <laughs> there are a ton of videos online about RV products you must buy in order to really enjoy and maximize this RV lifestyle. And we, like you, have watched many of these videos and even bought a ton of products based on those videos only to end up with products that are either broken and thrown in the trash or just collecting a boatload of dust. Today, we're going to share with you 15 of the worst products and gear you don't need. As a matter of fact, in our opinion, they're a big waste of money. Oh, and stick around to the end so you don't miss some of the most popular and expensive RV modifications that you might be considering right now. That some of these may not fit your RV lifestyle and certainly may not be worth the investment. Let's get into it. Let's kick things off with traditional dishware. Y'all seriously, glass or ceramic dishware, do not use those in your RV. They're seriously prone to breaking. And one of the things for sure is you can hear those things at times rattling down the yeah. road and your fingers are crossed and hoping that they don't break. We were subject to things like this early on in our days of RV life, but we've quickly learned to use things like durable and strong for microwave use. And we're going to be adding to our collection the Corels, which are really nice dinnerware. They're durable. If you want to have that sort of home vibe of dishware, well, Corel would be the one to use for sure because it does give you that vibe of home dishware, but durability. RV toilet paper. Yeah. Now there's a real misconception out there that you need to have RV toilet paper for your RV or camper van. Yeah. And in our opinion, RV toilet paper is just quite frankly a ripoff. There's no reason you cannot get just septic safe toilet paper. It'll cost you like half as much or maybe even less as RV toilet paper would. Plus it would be more comfortable. Just if you're using septic safe toilet paper, just make sure you use quite a bit of water when you're putting it down, whether it's a set toilet like we have or a traditional black tank toilet system. Next up, holding tank sensor cleaner. Cleaners. Mm. Now we know a lot about holding tank sensors and cleaners, right Ben? Oh my God, yeah. They, they don't, don't work. work. Now our experience in our camper van with our gray holding tank sensor is that it very quickly stopped working. Now, just to be clear, we don't have a black tank, so we're talking about our gray tank here, but it's similar between two. And so when it stopped working, we asked some folks, what do we do? And they said, oh, get these you know, holding tank sensor cleaners, just drop them in and it should clean it right up. And so we, we got a lot yeah, of them, yeah. by the way, from many different yeah. versions and- uh, Yes, we got a lot of them. We kept on putting them in and- None of them worked. None of them 
them work. So in our experience, we don't think they work. We would not waste your money, not have you waste your money on buying those sensor cleaners. Propane stove tops inside your RV. Now this one might sound a little confusing. I know a lot of RVs come with those propane burners, but in our RV, you know, from personal experience, we have never used it once in three years. That's yeah. because we use our propane for our heat, we use our propane for water, and then haven't used that for cook as well. Well, we think we would eat up and burn through that propane very quickly. So we right away adopted, or in other words, bought an induction cooktop. It just made more sense for us, right? Power RV awnings with little support. Well, we can certainly speak to the power RV awning. We hardly use ours, right babe? No, it's true. And we had the option at the time of purchase, to, this is an addition, do you get the awning or not? We thought, oh, we definitely want the awning. Mm -hmm. right? We thought we'd use it all the time. But the fact of the matter is we've had issues. It's a very lightweight awning. It flops around a lot in the wind. It's, it's actually gotten stuck a few times. It has, and it could be very dangerous. You know, even though it has a powered safety feature that if the wind blows, it's a wind sensor. Well, if you get a dust devil, I don't know. I don't think that awning is going to make it back into retract mode. It's definitely gonna be out blown away. Next up, Wi-Fi boosters. How many RVs come with the option to get a Wi-Fi booster on top of your rig? And we just think they're a waste of money and just not worth it. Most Wi-Fis in RV parks aren't probably gonna be very good anyway. And so getting the Wi-Fi booster may not help you that much. We would much rather invest in a cell phone, a cell service booster effectively, like a WeBoost Reach, which we have done so, and that has actually helped us out. Or if you're doing some very remote camping, you know, maybe invest in a Starlink system as well, something like that. But Wi-Fi boosters, don't waste your money. I know, I know, ancient Blu-ray devices. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, believe it or not, some RV packages when you're buying an RV will offer you a Blu-ray entertainment package, right? And we actually, we actually ended up getting that because it came with the TV and the sound bar the and the Blu-ray Blu is part of it. But if you can opt out of the Blu-ray, I mean, definitely do that because it's a complete waste of money. I think we have used it one time, or I think our first time we got the RV, we said, oh, we got to watch a DVD, right? So we went and bought one at Walmart, watched it, never have used it again. Mm -hmm. Many of you know Dave and I have been working on getting healthier over the last month and not just our physical health from enjoying some of the beautiful hikes that we've gone on, but what we put into our bodies. I love to cook and y'all know I do, but over the last few months, it's been really, really hard for us to get on a consistent meal schedule until now. And that's where we're excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Factor. Factor helps make meeting our nutritional goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to our doorstep. Their team of gourmet chefs create meals using only ingredients to help us feel our best all day long. Factor takes the guesswork out of grocery shopping and meal prep, saving us time and energy for other things like filming our next adventure or planning our first big meetup, which I hope you'll attend. They even offer keto, calorie smart, chef's choice, and vegan and veggie options, which include seafood, meat, and plant-based meals. And Factor is our definite go-to lunch and dinner solution when we're really busy. Ah! So I hope we convince you to add a little bit more balanced nutrition in your life. And to get started with your Factor Box, just go to factor75.com or click the link in the description below using our code LTIUW50 for 50% off your first Factor Box. That's factor75.com or click the link in the description below using our promo code LTIUW50 for 50% off your first Factor Box cheap portable vacuum cleaner. Ooh, let me tell y'all, cheap vacuums are terrible, 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 terrible. I can't tell you how many I've gone through until I found the perfect one, which is what we're using right now. They break, they have their own quirks. Some of them don't charge properly. Some of them charge fully, but then die in two seconds. Yes. It's just been one thing after another because we tried to save a buck or two when it comes to vacuum cleaners. The one we're using right now currently is a Bissell pet vacuum. And we really love that because we have two cats. And so it gets in all those nooks and crannies and I don't end up with cat litter in my bed. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to save space and going for a cheap foldable broom. Mm. Similar to the vacuum cleaner, cheap <laughs> is cheap, y'all. I'm just gonna say that right off the back. And having a foldable broom, just trying to save space being in a small RV made a lot of sense. But the durability of that thing, I felt like even trying to sweep off my outdoor rug was a project. I probably had more pain oh. in my back than actually cleaning my room. Oh, it was <laughs> cleaning the rug. It was a complete pain, right? Because it wasn't very long, so I'd be like leaning over trying, trying to sweep and then putting it away in the garage. I felt like I was breaking it constantly because it was not made very well. So what's the best thing to do, babe? Best thing to do is just suck it up and go ahead and invest in a quality broom because it's so worth it. Continuing with 
the cheap. As we uh, speak from experience, cheap holding tank treatments. Now the last thing you want to do is smell your tanks <laughs> right when you're RVing. <laughs> and uh, when we started out, we bought you know some of the cheapest stuff you could at Walmart to put into the holding tank. And initially it seemed to work okay. Mm -hmm. But then as we RV more, you start to get a smell coming from the tank. And we soon realized you need to invest in a quality tank uh, cleaner effectively to avoid those smells. Oh, and I do want to mention one other thing about those holding tank treatments. If you go with the cheap ones, some of those can have hazardous chemicals in right. them. So you're in a confined small space. Where is that going to go? It's going to come back up into your RV, which means you're going to breathe that in. So just be really cautious about holding tank treatments and what ingredients are in those. Oh my goodness, Dave, on this one. Cheap fresh water hoses. Mm. Mm -mm. Now when it comes to your fresh water hose, don't cheap out. I know it's a recurring theme. Don't cheap out. But if you buy the cheapest water hose, it might just be that white hose, which is very cumbersome, does not store very well, is not very flexible. We actually recommend getting rid of that, investing in a zero G style water hose. We find those are incredibly convenient and they store very well. Last on our list when it comes to the cheap, but certainly not least, cheap sewer hoses, y'all. Mm, mm -mm. Now this one's important. Don't cheap out on your sewer hose. The last thing you want to do is have an accident or a leak or crack or something in your sewer hose out of the black tank or even the gray water tank. This is going to be stink. It will stink. It's messy. That's why it's his job, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why it's, that's why it's my job. You want to have a good quality sewer hose, one that stores well, is flexible, does not break down quickly. And uh, we actually would recommend going with a Campco Rhino or something similar like that. They compact very nicely in the space. They're durable. They're very flexible. And um, you really can't go wrong with that. Non-adjustable water pressure regulator. Now, I remember this. When we first bought our RV, we bought a very simple non-adjustable water pressure regulator. Just something very simple. It, to didn't, do have a, it didn't have a gauge. It didn't even have a gauge. Yeah. So that's definitely something we would not recommend if we were to do it all over again. We would prefer to have a adjustable pressure gauge water regulator. And you know, but the biggest thing for folks that's not like us, where we tend to use water right from our tanks. Well, a lot of RVs, when they're in parks or different places, they tend to use the water directly from the source. And a lot of times, if you don't have that pressure regulator on there, you can't monitor what pressure is coming out of the shower or what's coming out of your sink. And so having that adjustable option really makes a big difference. So really invest in a good water pressure regulator adjustable laundry in your rig do you really need a washer and dryer in your rig well a lot of those bigger rigs those are the ones that have laundry facilities I guess I call them washer and dryers in their rig but at the same time those are the same type of rigs that end up going to campgrounds and a lot of campgrounds have laundromats in them right so uh, why, why, why? Now this one is more of a personal preference or how you camp. Do you really need washer and dryer in your rig? Well, if you're gonna be at campgrounds, a lot of campgrounds do have laundry facilities there and available. So there's that option. Plus it's a real big cost when it comes to uh, water. Yeah, no, it's true. And plus the capacity is very small in those. And from our perspective, it's just not worth the investment for us in terms of how we camp. And just to be quite honest, it's just another thing that could possibly go wrong in your rig. And a lot of times they're way more expensive than you think. Overstocking your maintenance and hookup supplies. Oh boy. Now this one we're definitely guilty of. <laughs> me in particular. Yeah, yeah, right? pretty much, yeah. Yeah, when we, when we kind of went on our first cross-country road trip, we just like hacked up our garage Ooh. just full of stuff. And I had all these backups. Double right? the like, hoses. Yeah, like backup hoses, <laughs> backup water lines, backup filters. We even had a backup toilet, y'all. Yeah, we yes. had a back, backup <laughs> toilet. set toilet, right? And so we, a lot of our garage was taken up with these backups. Now before we get into the budget, busting mods that people do on their RVs all day long, well, including us, we're going to share with you a bonus. And this bonus really pertains to a lot of those RV newbies. It's RV memberships. There are a lot of memberships out there that you can get into and it can be it could actually start adding up very quickly. So you might want to figure out your lifestyle and your travel lifestyle before you go investing into memberships. Now, just to give you a few popular examples, I mean, one of the big ones is... Thousand Trails. Yes, Thousand Trails. Right, and we know we have some friends who are members there. They love it, they use it, but they're expensive, oh, right? These time. members are expensive. So you want to make sure that you're actually going to go to Thousand Trails and actually get your money's worth before you jump into that. So we just recommend figuring out exactly what Tanya said, learn how you like to camp will you really use those thousand trail rv locations or not before you actually invest in a membership absolutely another really popular one is good sam's and a lot of places may have good sam recommendations but that's really all it comes down to if you're staying there for like a couple days for those good sam's discounts if you're staying longer than a week it might actually be cheaper just doing a weekly rate with the campground itself right 
Yes, that's right. And one that's really popular for us, we actually love and use it all the time, is Harvest Host, right? Yeah, no, that's right. And it's really because we do a lot of boondocking and road trips. And when you're on the road, sometimes you need that one overnight spot. We don't worry about being plugged up. And they're in really nice locations. Oh, they're absolutely amazing. And if your trips are just used to being powered up 100% of the time, well, Harvest Host is not for you. So you want to think about those things during right. your, uh, your travel plans and actually how you plan on living your life in this RV lifestyle. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in Harvest Host, there's a link down in the description box below. We have a promo code to kind of get you started with that. We absolutely love enjoy using it. And if you click that link below, you'll enjoy using it as well. A little shameless self-promotion. <laughs> I think this is a good time for us to get in some of those budget buster RV mods. I think it is. And these are things we love. We do. Right? But they may not be for everyone. First up, getting a 4x4 four four rig. Now whether these mods are worth it to you or not really depends on how you like to camp. And for us, we actually got all these things we're talking about. We actually got these mods and they were worth it to us. But if you don't like to get off road and or go in bad weather or things like that, <laughs> you don't need these mods, right? And getting a 4x4 four four capable RV is very expensive. It's a very expensive option. And it also will, the rig will drive more truck-like as well. If you're getting, say, a van, you get 4x4 four four on that. I mean, we drove a Sprinter recently with 4x4, four four, and it drove very truck-like, not the type of drive that we like. Lifted or raised suspension for <clears throat> added clearance. <laughs> yes. Boys and their toys. Exactly. <laughs> I, again, whether it's worth it or not really depends on your camping style. Unless you really plan to get off-road and need that extra, and it's only really two inches extra of clearance, you're paying a lot for that extra clearance. Yeah, it's more capable and uh, what we found really the value was actually in having the enhanced shocks versus the standard shocks that came with the rig. Yeah. But actually the, the lift itself, do you need it? I think the jury's out on that. Yeah, I'd say, well, I have to honestly say one positive extra thing about that. It rides so much smoother. Like yeah. I felt like riding, for me, driving an RV for the first time back then, it was just one of those things where I felt like when we didn't have the suspension, it was kind of like riding in a boat on a wave. Every time I hit a bump, it would That's bounce. True. But with the shock system that we have in place now, for us, it was 150% worth it. Is it for you? I don't know. But for us, it was worth it. This is a big one, y'all. So listen up. Lithium batteries and solar panels. You know, lately, lithium batteries and solar panels have really been like the talk of the town. As a matter of fact, we've seen a lot of Class A's and travel trailers starting to add more of that solar and unshored powered hookup lifestyle. And we already do that. So if you're a person that 100% loves to be powered to a wall, then basically, it's not for you. But if you like that lifestyle like us, we're more boondocked or off grids, which a lot of people are moving towards and it's definitely worth the investment. So you're checking out this video because you want to know some really great RV overnight camp spots. Now, Dave and I, we have been hmm, to a little over 30 states in the last year. And during that time, we've stayed at a lot of overnighters. <laughs> yes, we've had a lot of long drives and we're having those long days. You want to roll into a really great spot to overnight in. Yeah, and some of the easiest spots that we all think that used to be favorites is Walmart, but you see that? I did see that. Put the brakes on that because they have been putting a stop to all of us RVers camping at those spots. So today we're going to share with you 17 RV overnighters that are way, capital W, way better than Walmart. Now, some of these are gonna be free and some are part of membership programs. Yeah, and this one in particular, you may know or you may not know if this is gonna be your first adventure in your RV. Harvest Host, we love Harvest Host. Yes, Harvest Hosts are great. Now, it is a membership program, costs about $99 a year, but it gives you access to thousands of like wineries, breweries, even a racetrack. Oh yeah. Bison farms, alpaca farms. Yeah. We've had some amazing experiences at Harvest Host this past year. Yeah, now I will say with one thing with Harvest Host, you know, they do expect you a harvest, they're hosting you. They may have gifts. Be kind to them. They are allowing you they're opening up their spot yes. for you to enjoy. So maybe buy something like we did at the alpaca farm. I bought a little alpaca. I had baby alpaca fur and he was so cute. Cuddly. Wasn't a real alpaca. No, no, no. It was a stuffed ba animal. Baby yeah. yeah, but he was cute and cuddly. <laughs> <laughs> now this next one is related to Harvest Host now. It's Boondockers Welcome. It's owned by Harvest Host, so it's naturally an upsell in their program, but it gives you access to 3,000 typically other RVers that welcome you into their kind of parking lot. We can kind of come in there and park for the night. And it's actually really cool. You can meet some really great people as well. Ooh, walking on this dusty yet beautiful park path, I have to tell you, it reminds us of a really great spot that we enjoy camping for free overnight, and that's BLM Land, which is Bureau of Land Management. Now, a lot of this is 
Dispersed Free Camping is located in the western part of the U.S. and we really do enjoy it. You can stay overnight, you can even stay up to 14 days, which is plenty of time to get your camping on. But let me tell you something, watch out for those roads. You know, some rigs, it might not be a good idea to go down some of those choppy roads. So if you're gonna go into BLM Land, even if it's for overnight, make sure you know exactly what to expect when you're riding into those lands. Another great overnight spot that we really enjoy are national forests. And we're not talking about national parks, so we're talking about national forests. And you can actually camp for free in most national forests. And just be careful though, similar to the BLM roads, the roads into the national forest, some of those can be really tough. So just be very careful when you're looking at those roads before you head on in and drive into the national forest. Now we have noticed some no camping signs popping up in some national forest locations where we've previously camped. And we think that's really because they're allowing some of the areas to recover because of over use since the pandemic. Now speaking of parks, you can't forget to check out the city and county parks, especially out toward the Midwest area. You know, Dave and I, we really do enjoy checking out these sort of free overnight camping spots in these city parks when available. Now, even some of these campgrounds, they may have power that you would only have to pay five, 10 bucks to use that. We actually had a great example of that out in Forest City, Iowa, when we bought our uh, RV Desert Snow. Now, I will tell you this, because of the surge in RVs that have been kind of hitting the roads lately, you might want to just double check with the city and the state and their local ordinances to make sure it's still allowed to park in some of these places because you don't want to find yourself in a little bit of trouble. We should probably talk about where they can find some of these cool places to camp. Yeah, no, that, that's a good idea. And there's actually several apps that we really find very useful when we search for these spots. One is the All Stays app. Uh, another is actually the RV Life Trip Wizard. And then also Campendium. It's very useful too for reviews as well. Like what do people say about the spot? Is it safe, things like that. Yeah, very, very good point. Spot is a goodie and we really do enjoy Cracker Barrel. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're great for overnight camping. Uh, you can have some breakfast, go back to your RV. You can have some lunch, go back yes. to your RV. Have some dinner, go back to your RV. Go use the bathroom, go back to your RV. You know, you know it, all those it, good things. It, it's like one of our favorite restaurants now since we've been RVing. <laughs> it's right? so true, yeah. Cracker Barrel. Yeah. You can stay at most Cracker Barrels, but we do recommend when you get to a Cracker Barrel, just talk to the manager inside, just make sure it's okay. Make sure there's no city ordinance or something that might actually restrict it. Absolutely. And if they're not available when you get there, look for signs. A lot of times they'll have a sign outside that yeah. may say no overnight camping, even if it's Cracker Barrel, you guys, because you know, not everyone is welcoming. So it's smart to do your diligence. Hey, really quick in regards to overnight camping at Cracker Barrel and other places similar to this, you know, be respectful. You're really not supposed to, and you should not pull out your awning, pull out a fire pit, pull out chairs. Really respect the grounds that you're on. And if you have to pull out your slide for whatever reason, to get into the refrigerator, maybe even get into the bathroom. Well, go inside and talk with the management. Let them know that you're gonna do this and then park in a way that you're not going to literally be on top of your neighbor. great RV overnighter are these big bulk stores like Costco, BJ's, Sam's Club. You know, they have really big parking lots and they usually have nice overhang lighting in the evening, which is nice. I like to be in places that are well lit. Now, Costco generally is pretty friendly to RV overnighting, but again, go inside, check with the management to make sure that particular Costco does allow it. And if it is allowed, just be respectful, respect the etiquette, because again, you're there to RV overnight, not to set up camp. Oh, look at that, babe. Yeah, that's a pretty cool rig. That is a very oh, cool. Okay. Hello, we'll bring the wine. Can oh. I see what it looks like inside? Maybe we'll have to try that, maybe. Huh? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's have been very popular RV overnight spots over the years. And we've enjoyed them too. You know, it's have great big parking lots. It's fun going to the stores as well. Now, we have noticed recently, I just want to say this, that some of the Cabela's in particular have not been allowing RV overnighters. So definitely if you're going there, talk to management and make sure it's okay to stay overnight. You 
know, truck stops are a great place for RV overnight camping, especially ones that have designated spots for RVers because you don't want to take up a spot that is designed for a trucker. Those guys, let me tell you, they're driving hours upon hours right. at a time to get you your stuff on time. So let them have their spots. Exactly. <laughs> I think it's getting harder and harder for them too to even find a spot, it sounds like. Wow. But fortunately, a lot of these places now have designated RV spots, right? We stayed at Iowa 80. Oh my God, that was so which, much fun. Which has an RV spot and it was awesome. Like it we was. loved it. But then you have, you have like Loves now have designated spots as well in many of the places, as well as like Flying J's. Yeah. So there's definitely options out there. Now, speaking of Pilot Flying J's and Loves, they're now really starting to cater more to the RV community. They're even offering spaces for just RVers that allow hookups for an extra fee. Um, some are offering shower facilities, laundromats, and even places for your pets. We've also been noticing that our V spots with hookups yeah. even for about 20 bucks a night where you can stay overnight in a rest area. Yeah, and if you're going to stay at a rest area, maybe try using the RV Life Wizard app to check out what reviews have to say about that particular rest stop just to make sure it's safe and sound when you get there. So let's talk about churches and shopping malls. No. Okay, well those go together like peas in a pod. Yes, they do. You know, <laughs> after church, I like to do a little shopping okay. after church. Those are really great spots for overnight camping, large churches in particular. Again, contact the church, make sure that particular church allows you to overnight camp, as well as the shopping malls. But shopping malls are pretty friendly with RV overnight camping. County fairgrounds can also be a really good spot too. Oh yeah. Right, you know, if no fairs going on, there's often a lot of space available and they may have hookups too for a small fee, so definitely check that out. Oh yeah, they're definitely a big open space. Wide open spaces. Let's see where we're going on that one. <laughs> good. <laughs> Ooh, so we should probably talk about casinos because you know that's a very popular thing nowadays. I mean, we're in Vegas right now and casinos right. are pretty popular. <laughs> exactly. Now, we will say in Vegas, in terms of overnighting a casino parking lot, you really can't do it by city ordinance. Now, you can say in an RV park at some of the casinos. That's very different though. We aren't talking about that. No. See, even the little doggy over there, he doesn't like the fact that he can't RV park in the casino. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, we do know across the country, casinos vary from location to location. So check, you can definitely park overnight at some casino locations, but not all. Yeah, and a lot of them, they'll have a campground uh, right next door to it for a fee. It might even be a small fee if you get a player's card or something right. to that effect to draw you into the casino. So there's different options when it comes to that, but like Dave is right, just check to make sure uh, they have availability. <laughs> and if you didn't guess it, from time to take it on that dangerous slope, we actually really enjoy overnighting at ski areas. Many ski areas allow RVs to overnight for free, both in the winter months and in the summer months. And those are absolutely beautiful spots. So definitely, if you're going to be in the mountains near ski areas, check that out. Give them a call and see if you can park overnight for free at ski areas. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Dave has a chance to take the trophy. Can he do it? <gasps> oh! It's in the hole! It's Many public golf course parking lots are available for overnight parking for RVers during the off season. Now during the season, Harvest House has over 450 golf course sites available for overnight parking to premium members. Now, we stayed at a beautiful golf course in Wyoming and it was absolutely gorgeous. Now, if you're not following us on Instagram, you definitely should because we share a ton of moments you don't want to miss. Many home improvement stores like Home Depot, Lowe's, and Tractor Supply often allow RV parking overnight as well. Just one tip on that. We recommend getting in at 8 p.m. and later when customer parking really dies down so that you aren't like taking up customer parking spaces. And just really quick, you know, times are always changing. The more RVers on the road, the more the rules have changed. So we would highly recommend just checking with that manager to make sure you can actually overnight park there because you don't want to get a middle of the night knock or wake up to a boot on your rig. Ooh, so we thought we'd bring it 
out of the heat right now because I did not put a sunblock on. I don't think you did either. No, no, I did not. But it's a perfect opportunity since we just had some protein bars and water to share a couple extra bonuses. Bonuses. With the, yeah, some bonus ones. Yeah, and these ones are quite more unusual, mm -hmm. right? And uh, one thing we've noticed is that some county and city visitor centers, some of those are actually offering RV overnight parking spots as yeah. well. So de definitely take a look. Maybe we'll get lucky with that as well. Now, if you're driving in the mountains in the summer months, another spot to consider are actually the chain pullout areas. You actually put chains on your tires. Well, obviously, you don't need to do that in the summer months, and many times you can stay there overnight during the summer. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of van lifers and smaller RVers love using fitness centers for showering, not just working out. I mean, showers where you have enough space, where you can twirl and twist, <laughs> twirl. and it gets all those good parts That's without running does. into walls. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just for that. A lot of us love to use fitness centers as overnight camping spots, in particular, Anytime Fitness, as well as uh, Planet Fitness. We've seen RVers uh, and vans parking overnight in some of those. So those are great options. Now, Elk Lodges are another great spot too as well. Now you do need to have a membership, but if you have an Elk Lodge membership, you can park in their designated parking spots for RVers around the country. And one of our favorite, I'm kind of knocking these out, y'all, because I'm feeling it. One of our favorites and coolest, and we actually had a birthday celebration. Oh, wait, I know this one. You do. This is a great one. It's great. And you may know it. It's the famous wall drug. You know, the five cent coffee signs that are all right. the way down the highway. You just can't, South Dakota. You can't miss it. Well, they do have great spots for RV parking. And then you can go and enjoy some of the amenities, see the kind of crazy wild attractions they have there. But just be forewarned, it is right up on a train track. So yes. it might get a little honk, 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 but it's free, can't beat it. And colleges and universities also can offer uh, overnight parking as well. If you think about the football season, you have a lot of times these large parking lots kind of for tailgating and things like that. And so if it's in the off season, check with those places. Maybe you'll be able to stay there overnight as well. And then also don't forget about state parks. There's yes. some amazingly beautiful state parks. Now, some you'll need to stay in campgrounds within those. There'll be a small fee for that, but they can be beautiful and well worth checking out. Like Valley of Fire is a place we really love. One of our favorite spots, Valley of Fire, is it's fire. You know, living in a camper van, van life, RV life, it's often portrayed on social media, such as Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, as this perfect bliss experience. You're always off in beautiful locations, eating gourmet cooked meals at your campground, in a perfectly clean and <clears throat> always working tiny home on wheels. <laughs> Now that's not to say some of these moments don't happen, they do. But today we're gonna to share with you some of the realities of RV life and van life that you rarely see on social media. <laughs> Hi. So in this video, we're gonna share with you nine huge lies about living in a camper van that not a lot of people talk about, but we are. Let's get into it. First up, you can park anywhere, right? Wrong. Wrong. Now you're often given the impression that if you have a small RV or a van, you can pretty much park overnight anywhere and that's just not the case remember our veil babe yes oh my gosh we were so excited we just picked up desert snow we're in bail and we're thinking wow look at all these spots where we can park we're exhausted we park in a spot we get out to get something to eat and the first thing we see is a sign that says no overnight parking here we had to really do some diligence to find a spot when we found a spot we were very happy, but it took us a long time to find one. And there's also some towns and cities with ordinances that will say no overnight parking. So you have to be aware of that. We actually did a video on some great RV overnighters that you can stay in. So definitely check out that video in the link below. Absolutely. So I just saw the perfect place for us to camp next. I was looking at this TikTok and this spot was absolutely gorgeous they were by themselves it was very beautiful it was very serene and it just makes me think when you get out there all campgrounds look like that all campsites look like that right wrong now of course not all campgrounds are beautiful despite what you might see on social media and many are actually very busy and if it's a new campground there may be no trees in it at all absolutely that does not mean that campgrounds are not beautiful there's plenty of yeah. amazing campgrounds but you don't always see what you get especially if you're looking at those different social media platforms even as sometimes we're kind of showcasing some of those beautiful scenes out in front of us because that's what we want to portray versus where it's actually in a Walmart parking lot. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing weather, all sunrises and sunsets. You know, while we all do enjoy a good sunrise and sunset, when you're living in a camper van, 
at some point in your life, you're gonna run into some bad weather. And I'm talking situations where, like for us, we had a hailstorm, and I'm talking hail that might actually damage your solar panels, break your windows, damage your, your home on wheels, and go even further, like tornadoes. They always tell you, get to the furthest, get to the lowest point, go to the basement. Well, you don't have a basement right. in your RV, right? Going to the bathroom is never a problem. Well, if you're living in a class A where nine times out of 10, you're gonna be in a campground, it probably isn't going to be a problem. But if you're in a small camper van, well, that's a different story, right? No, it's true. First of all, we don't actually poop in our rig, right? So, so we're always looking, we're on the road, we're looking for places, you know, rest areas or, or other, you know, say it's restaurants or things like that, we actually go in and use the bathroom. If we're off boondocking, we will set up our kind of tent yeah. poop for a little porta potty, our portable porta potty, yeah. which isn't the most pleasant experience either. No, but it does make you feel a lot better not having to do it inside your rig. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You will live in harmony with nature. You know, one of the things Dave and I, we really do enjoy is being out in nature. You know, going for hikes and seeing some of the beautiful creatures that exist out there, like the bald eagles, or bears, or moose, uh, foxes, wolves, like in Yellowstone. And it's a beautiful sight to see. But it's a very interesting sight when you have little critters. I'm talking spiders, we've had mice, Fortunately, we have two kitties, as you know, so they don't stand a chance. No matter how much I vacuum or keep things clean, it's a place for them to come enjoy spiders all the time. Oh, and yeah. that's, remember that one time we almost had a black widow I in know, here? That was very scary. That was very scary. So, you know, you just have to understand you're not always going to be able to keep nature outside of your rig. So as long as you know that up front, you might start preparing for it early. Oh, wait. Mosquito! Oh! Oh! Dave! Oh. Right, right here! <laughs> you will be taking these incredible open air showers in stunning locations with unlimited water. I think that's some magic. <laughs> <laughs> now we are somewhat lucky because our rig does have a 50 gallon fresh water tank. But even so, if we were to take showers all the time, the two of us, we would blow through our water so quickly boondocking. So in reality is you have very limited water. Yeah, and if you're looking to shower outside of your camper van, some rigs are actually set up so that you can enjoy an outdoor shower. While it could be really hard to find a private spot to do so, and uh, you don't really want to have a shower with all your neighbors watching. No problems with extreme temperatures. Just follow the weather to moderate conditions. Ah, uh, you see folks living in their camper vans during the summer and just really soaking in all that beauty that's around them. But what you don't see is a lot of times during those summer months, extreme heat can be really tough living in a camper van, unless you're living up in the mountains, right? No, it's very true. Extreme heat is really tough on camper vans. You're trying to maintain a good temperature. The sun's beating down on the top. AC is working super hard. The batteries are draining quickly. Yeah, and if you have pets, you have to be even more attuned to the temperatures within your rig. And that can be tough, especially if you don't have a proper monitoring system. So I think for a suggested point, just get a proper temperature monitoring system that you can monitor from your phone or just make sure you're not going too far from your yeah. rig and stay close to those four-legged beauties like my four-legged beauties looking at me right now. Hi, Mary. Hi, Mimi. Now in cold weather, it's a very different situation. Very right? different yes. ball game. Yes, and you have to make sure your pipes don't freeze because there's not a lot of insulation in most RVs. And so it's very easy for those pipes to freeze when the temperature drops below freezing. Yeah, and if you see us showering in our rig in the freezing cold, it's because our rig can handle it, okay? Maybe yours <laughs> might not, but ours can. RV living is cheap. Now we know some van lifers are able to live incredibly cheaply. Mm -hmm. But for many of us, RV life and living in a camper van is not cheap at all. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, maintenance costs, you need to add those in there as well, can really take a toll on you, especially in the RV and van life. And just know this, it's going to happen. It's going to happen all the time because this is your home on wheels. Yeah. So think of a home that moves. There's always going to be something that comes up. Doesn't mean you can't enjoy it. I just think you need to get handy so that you're not spending 80% of your time in the shop. And speaking of cost, if you're gonna be, say, camping at campgrounds, just know this, the price for a lot of campgrounds have 
increased quite a bit due to one, the amount of RVers now on the road today, and obviously the cost of living everywhere has gone up. Now we've actually done a video just highlighting all of our costs that we spent over the past year. Yeah. And you can kind of check that out in the description box below. Yeah, it's the complete breakdown of what true cost of living in the RV life is full time. You know, everything is always planned out perfectly in RV life. Now the reality about living in a camper van is that many times your future in terms of where you're staying, maybe the next night or the next week or the next month may not be planned out at all. Exactly. Right? And so you're constantly trying to figure out, okay, where are we going to go next? Where are we going next? And things aren't always well oiled. No, they're not. And just as long as you know that up front, you will be perfectly fine. And here's one very important point. You know, despite the challenges we have faced living in our camper van, we absolutely love it. Definitely. We've been full-time RV living now for over a year and it's just been an amazing experience. Yeah. From the people you meet, the places you go and the memories you're going to be making. I think it outweighs any of the issues you may face in the RV life. As long as you keep one foot in front of the other. <laughs> hey, for those of you that are new here, I'm Tanya and this is my husband, Dave, and we're Let's Turn It Up World. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. Yes, welcome to our channel. So Dave and I, we've been living in our Winnebago Echo for mm, full time for just a little over a year now. And we traveled in that year about 15,000 miles and touched 30 states, which is pretty impressive. Oh, it was an amazing journey. So we've learned a lot about the true cost of what it takes to live full time uh, in the RV life. And so we should just kick this party off right now and get started. Hey, if you haven't done so, take a second and hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you don't miss one of our upcoming adventures. All right, well, let's get into it. And let's start with what our biggest cost would have been, which is the camping overnight cost. And I'm gonna let Dave take this one because he did all the bookings. <laughs> And of course, camping overnight costs, we're talking about essentially like RV parks, RV resorts, campground costs, things like that. Of course, many places we stayed at, if we boondock or something like that, those were free. Uh, but we try to overall have an average cost per night of $35 a night. That was part of our targeted budget. We ended up actually at $32 a night. So, so pretty good. Not bad. Not, not bad for a first year. Exactly. Right? We had to boondock a fair amount to kind of bring down some of the costs of the some of the more expensive RV, RV resorts that we'll go into a little bit later. But that actually breaks down to at an annual amount. Uh, now we have, hold on you guys, yep. we actually have a sheet for this we put together because you can't remember everything. So we wrote That's it right. down. There's a sheet here. <laughs> <laughs> and the annual amount was $11,695. Yeah. Right. And that breaks down to a monthly rate of $975. And of course that equates to that average of $32 a night. Now we stayed in a variety of locations throughout the year. We, and we boondocked a fair amount. I'm talking, we boondocked some BLM lands and some other locations uh, and also fair amounts of like parking lots, Walmarts, you know, Iowa 80, Wall Drug. Right. Mm -hmm. Wall yeah, Wall Drug, Drug was great. That was a special one. Yeah. We actually right. stayed there for our birthday. Exactly. That was our, uh, birthday special. We wanted to save some of our budget for gifts. Absolutely. Right? Does that work? Maybe? That's a smart move. Does that uh, work? That does work you for buy me. buy that? Because we got some pretty good gifts. Yeah, we did. <laughs> now, we took full advantage of Harvest Host as much as we could during our trip as well, right? I know, absolutely. And Harvest Host, if you're not familiar with that, you should get on board. It's a really cool way to stay at places like wineries or even with families. It's just a lot of fun. Right. And I can't forget the uh, bison and alpaca farms we say that. Those were amazing. Those were a lot of fun. Yeah. And they're definitely cool in my opinion oh, like yeah. really really cool like i was feeding those bison just kind of like hey and they were giving me their kisses with their sloppy right, the, right, wet the tongues. long tongue kind of so wrapping, around, wrapping them. around you <laughs> <I know. laughs> now we driveway parked for free at family and friends when we could which the term for it is called mooch docking that's right and nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with that <laughs> and one of the coolest things we did was we were able to stay for free two weeks during the filming of a show that dave and i were involved in called rv unplugged now rv unplugged is a show that's i guess you would say survivor meets amazing race and so what i'll do is i'll put a link in the description box below if you want to check out the trailer for that but if you do make sure you vote for us that's right we are show. contestants everyone so contestants. go over there and vote, vote for, for us, us. <laughs> Now, by doing this, this truly helped keep our overall camping costs down. Now, however, we also stayed in quite a few RV resorts and RV parks while we were on the road. We did. And those are pretty expensive. And in addition, we also went to some of the more popular 
national parks like Yellowstone National Park. Yeah. Right, Grand Teton. Oh, that that was my favorite. Well, both oh. of those were just oh, equally as beautiful. So so beautiful, so incredible. And of course, the Black Hills as well. And we stayed in RV resorts and really all of those locations. Well, a campground in Grand Teton, but overall, it was an expensive visit for us in terms of nightly rates. Yeah, they can be costly. I mean, they're probably big tourist attractions as well, those national parks. So, yeah, I can see that for sure, but it was well worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of Yellowstone, you remember one of our favorite RV resources to stay at, Grizzly RV Park? I mean, it was super cool. So many cool amenities for RVers. Oh, no, it's a great spot. Just a great home base if you're yeah. visiting Yellowstone. Totally agree with you. Now, definitely not cheap, right? Over $100 a night. That pushed our rate up for sure, uh, but it was well worth it. Absolutely well worth it. Cha-ching! <laughs> now, because we were going so kind of crazy across the country, yeah. right, we couldn't take advantage of any monthly rates at RV resorts. But when we got back to Las Vegas, which is kind of like our home base here, yeah. right, we, we were staying for a 30-day period. So we did actually get a monthly rate at an RV resort outside Las Vegas, $815 a month plus utilities. Yeah. And that really did save us some money as well to keep costs lower. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like those weekly rates, those daily rates, sometimes when you're booking things and it has to be last minute because that's how we are. We're on the road trying to hit right. 30 states. The cost gets a lot higher. But if you can find a place and set it on for 30 days, you will save so much more money that way. Okay, so I think it's time to move on to the next category. Moving on, moving right. on. <laughs> and this next category ended up much higher than we initially had budgeted for. Yeah. Um, and it was really kind of unforeseen circumstances as well because prices spiked up. And of course, we're talking about gasoline prices. No mistake, you know, I'm those gas prices nowadays, <laughs> inflation, inflation. <laughs> exactly, and as Tanya mentioned before, we traveled about 15,000 miles through 30 different states. So we were driving a lot, and we're in a Ford Transit uh, chassis in the Echo, of course, which got about 13 miles to the gallon. So overall, in terms of when you kind of did all the math there and did all the tracking, our gasoline was on an annual basis, I'm looking at the cheat sheet again, was $4,700, a monthly amount of $392. And that really yeah. was quite a bit above what we initially had expected today. Oh, big time. Today. Absolutely big time. I mean, they just, they. I feel like the gas prices, even during that time, they spiked. Oh, it was painful. So, so you had like your your set focus, you were trucking along the way, you knew what gas prices were, and all oh, of a yeah. sudden it was like right in the middle of all that. It was just like, boom. Oh, they went so high. Also, depending on the state you're in, you kind of, you it's kind of more expensive in certain states and certain areas and it yeah. would drop down, but we hit some pretty high prices. Yeah, we try to use a little bit of a cheat sheet, like where are the cheaper gas exactly. prices so we can figure we can make it through this state <laughs> before we get to the next one. We can get gas in the next state and that's gonna be a little bit cheaper than this one. So, I know. You know, we had all kinds of ways to figure out how to save money, but at the end of the day, the prices went, woo! Some expensive fill ups. Hell yeah. So we all have to eat, you know, to survive in this world, you have to eat. So we need to talk about the groceries and the restaurant costs. Now, Dave and I, we tend to, we try to cook as much as we can inside and outside of our rig, which definitely helps cut back on some of the costs. But like gas, inflation has disrupted yeah, that as bad. well because grocery prices have, in our opinion, doubled. It's almost equivalent to going out to eat anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's been crazy. It has been crazy. So let me just tell you quickly about our grocery costs, which when the spike happened as well. So overall, our grocery costs are $8,300 for groceries for the year, which equates about $692 per month. Right, and it does sound like a lot, but I gotta say, still well worth it. And plus, I mean, you do an amazing job, babe, cooking oh, in such a small you. space. I mean, I love gotta it. hand it to Tanya, just does an incredible job in desert snow. Yeah, and this guy right here, I gotta toot it. We gotta throw it right <laughs> back at Dave because when it comes to grilling, he's like the grill master. I mean, we could eat steaks and grilled onions and he just makes them with so much flavor, well, he's like so the grill like master. that post oak little smokiness to it. Well, I do, and that's why it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> And we did also take advantage of some of the local restaurants, you know, places where we know they have like that authentic vibe and we didn't want to miss out on an opportunity since we were there. Right. So we spent about $3,000 at restaurants and other places uh, eating out. And that was about $250 per month. So, you know, overall things are not cheap, but at the same time, um, you gotta eat. All right, so now it's time for everyone's favorite topic, right? <laughs> right? RV insurance, of course, and RV maintenance. Woo! Woo! Exciting <laughs> times, boys! Right, so so the RV insurance for our Winnebago Echo uh, was about $1,100 
for the year, which mm -hmm. makes which was about ninety two dollars a month. That also included that includes roadside assistance in that as well, which fortunately we did not have to use. But important to have the year, right? And exactly, yeah. very very important to have. Uh, and then on the RV maintenance side, fortunately, our rig uh, was under warranty. Brand new. Burning. Right, right. So thank the Lord for that. Thank the right. Lord for that. Because we did get some things, uh, <laughs> some, some, some of the warranty work done on it for yeah, sure. A lot. Right, exactly. <laughs> Brand new. Right. Brand but, new rigs. But because of that, our RV maintenance is really more around oil changes and things like that. So about $600 for the year or $50 per month. Mm. You know, like during the year, we actually bought some accessories for the RV as, yeah. you know, new RVers at that time on the road. We probably bought some accessories that we didn't need as well because we didn't know what we needed right, until no, we true. actually tried it. But we did get quite a few things that we did need. I'm talking things like, and I wrote this down, yeah. like the bike rack, which yeah, is a really a big deal. One. That was important. Yeah, we our, used to store the bikes like in the in our garage space. Yeah. And that was a pain, right? Because you had the bikes at the bottom and then everything on top. You, you had to take everything out and then put everything back in yeah. to get the bikes out. Like Tetris. He had to do it. Was Tetris. The, it was yeah. like playing Tetris in that garage until we got the bike rack. And now it's not like playing Tetris. It's just like playing boxes <laughs> I, I bought a piece of a bike rack so maybe spent a little too much there but yeah but that's great just like the compressor yeah I went that's on that really too. important to yeah. have and i think you got a really good compressor that makes us feel safe on the road especially if we're traveling to places right. or we're boondocking it's you know true. sometimes you may have to let the air out of the tires so you don't get stuck and then you have a compressor so you can put them back in when you need it right. probably the most amazing um uh <sighs> is the kitty screens the kitty right screens. i knew yeah. you're gonna go there yes exactly. our cat kitty screens were I felt like those are really important. We got some custom made kitty screens for the cats. So this way, when they're traveling with us, some of those screens are pretty sensitive and a cat's claws will shred right through them. So the kitty screens that we have prevent them from doing that. We also got something which was the dehumidifier. And for right. us, we do a lot of winter camping. And so having that small dehumidifier prevents, you know, you get those sweaty walls. And so having a dehumidifier prevents you from having those sweaty walls. Don't want to have the sweaty walls. Don't have the sweaty walls. No one can resist my sweaty balls. <laughs> All right, we also got like an induction cooktop, a Berkey, and all right, getting cutting to the chase here, that cost was, RV accessories was $1,500 for the year uh, or $125 per month. And yes, I know it seems a bit high, but it's our, also our first year in the RV. So we're trying to create the accessories or get the things that we think we'll need. So this year, I'm sure that price will go way down. I hope, right? I hope so. And we also did make some pretty major mods yeah. to the RV and they, they were expensive. Yes, right? they were. Now they, these were discretionary, but ones we felt were important Very. for our enjoyment. Cause we like to, to go off grid, yeah. do winter camping in the snow. And so our most expensive mod was getting the Quigley lift. Yes. Right, and the Falcon larger tires mm -hmm. on there as well. And we did some other mods as well inside yeah. to kind of more personalize the rig overall. And this is a pretty big number. Overall, our annual cost was $9,500 for all of our mods that we did to the rig. And that monthly is $792 a month. Yeah, that was a pretty, pretty big one. But right. I definitely feel you're right. It was really important for us to have that comfortable capability, especially since we do like to go off grid or boondocking and it can be pretty low. You know how nervous I was yeah, before I we got it. And now ah, I'm happy as right. a plan. And we do hope next year that cost goes way down. Oh, it will. Unless you plan on getting another lift. Yeah, well, she's talking, it's going way down. Unless you plan on getting another lift. No, no, no more of that. <laughs> now, one of the things, you know, Dave and I really love taking advantage of are the activities and entertainment in different area. You know, when you're going to local spots, there's some fun things that you can do that you don't want to miss that you may not happen to find anywhere else. So I'm just going to break it down for you really quick and throw out the price of what that costs for us. So that was $2,800 for the year or $233 per month. And we did a lot of great things. Like remember the ATV uh, through Custer uh, yeah, State no, Park in the Black cool. Hills? No, absolutely, very cool. And you're gonna splurge on things. If you go to some local destinations, like in Virginia City, you yes. had that, those amazing theaters those there. Two theaters. We had to do it. We right? really did have to do that. Or like the hot springs in Idaho. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of fun. I mean, we could have got Mike Nakin and the exactly. hot springs. And, and, and of course, one of the big ones was the Grand Canyon Railway. Yes. Right, that was a bit of a splurge. Yeah, and we do like to watch movies when we're kind of back at the rig just to kind of relax 
but you need streaming services for that. So that's another big added cost for us um, as well that we had in there. So that was... Yeah, I felt overall we did a pretty good job there. We did. Right, with, every, with all the different options. Now we should talk about rallies and shows that we attended during the year. Good point. Um, of course, we went to the uh, Winnebago Grand National Rally, which was a lot of fun. That was so right. much fun. So glad we went to that. And then the Hershey RV Show in Pennsylvania, what of course. What a big show. Right. right. It's a big it's show. It's a big show. A giant show. Gigantic. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but well worth it. We had a great time at both of those. Overall, the cost for those were about $500 for the year, or $42 a month. So, yeah. um, probably have about the same next year. I'm sure we'll do it again next year. Oh, heck yeah. Right. So. And maybe even do some more shows. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe the gas prices will come down. So it'll be a nice little balance for that. Right. But we shall see. Or maybe they'll go even higher. I'd like, be to, awful. And I'd like to do some overland shows or something like that. I think that'd be cool. That's a good idea. Right? So Dave and I being full-time travel content creators, we work from the road. So what's really important to us is having the access of the internet and cell phone at all times, which is very important to us. So the cost for that is $2,700 uh, for the year or $225 per month. And that includes us having our cell phones, our hotspots so that we're able to access different places, especially for in remote places that we need to have access to. Um, and we did later on in the year, we got Starlink. Yeah, we did get Starlink, yeah. right? And so that may end up replacing, who knows, maybe next year. Some of the hotspots. Uh, exactly, so we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's probably a good idea because they, they're pretty expensive. And once you run out of that data, you know, you, no, it's true. Run out. <laughs> Starlink is the best. <laughs> Not sponsored. <laughs> Good. Now our rigs heat and cooktops run off propane and we mm -hmm. found that for over the year we spent about $200 or $17 a month on propane cost. Yes. So not too bad. We do a lot of winter camping as well. We found that in the snow and in the cold, our heating system is incredibly efficient. The insulation. Right, so we didn't actually use as much propane as we initially expected that we would. Right, and we have an induction cooktop too, right. so try to compensate between using that and trying to stay away from the propane gas for exactly. cooking, which we use the. Yeah, and that makes a big difference. Big difference. Now along the way, we did buy some like clothing and merchandise oh, yeah. uh, throughout the year, especially for doing things like the winter camping. We may have needed some additional items. Yeah. Um, we didn't pack as much. We packed a lot, right. but not enough right. of well, the right might, stuff. You might see like a cool sweatshirt somewhere. You just gotta get it. Yeah, so or a pair of socks or gloves or, so you So you're know. being so, uh, you're buying things that are very useful. Yeah, which is really rare for you it's to say that. For you. Not useful. Very it's usually me, the not useful <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but anyway, the cost of uh, that for clothing, we spent about five hundred dollars on these type of things over the course of a year, yeah. or about forty-two dollars for the month. Yeah, not too bad. Okay, now there are a few miscellaneous items we should quickly run through. Yeah, I think as well. One is tolls. Now, we didn't spend as much on tolls as we would have if we stayed, say, in the Northeast. Yeah. Or down in, say, Florida. Oh, yeah. Right? We were here more in the, the mountain states. So, overall, our tolls were about $100 mm -hmm, that's right. uh, for the year. And then, of course, laundry. Everyone's favorite subject. Yeah. Right? Uh, laundry was about 100 bucks. Yeah, about 100 bucks. Yeah, I mean, Not I, too bad. I needed my detergents. And, of course, it varied between which facility we're using. I know some folks with the bigger rigs have laundry available to them inside their rig. We don't. So we have to take it to whatever laundromat we go to. And, and those prices definitely varied between the states. Right, and then also memberships and passes. Oh yeah. Where we spent about $335 the year on those. And we have like Harvest Hose, mm -hmm. RV Trip Wizard Love from RV it. Life, which, yeah. which you find very useful. Good Sam. Oh yeah. Of course. And of course, uh, America the Beautiful Pass. Yeah. Can't forget that. That saved us a lot of money. And I feel like those four in particular, I feel like you really make your money back. Oh, You know, absolutely. whatever you spend on those passes, you make them back. If you're out there using it as much as we have, it's almost paid for itself. All right, so without further ado, the overall total cost for our full-time RV living one-year experience is, wait for it, drum roll, please. Drum roll, here we go. Oh, uh, wait, wait, hold on, give me a beat. Oh, beat. You're gonna be beat You're now. Serious. I'm serious. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, okay. All right. It's forty-seven thousand six hundred and thirty dollars, or about three thousand nine hundred and sixty-nine dollars per month. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Right. Definitely more than we anticipated. Now that, of course, includes that you know the expensive mods that we did 
as well. Right, and we took those mods out, right, the total cost would be 38130 Right. Right, or 3178 but still more on the expensive side. Yeah. And I think as we go into next year, maybe we can bring them down some. We'll yeah, see. I definitely feel one of the major reasons it is high for us too, especially with the camping, you know, being our first time full-time doing it, we spent more time in the campgrounds. We right. got familiar with the boondocking, um, and I think now we're very comfortable with our rig as well as, um, you know, our experiences. So I yeah. think this year we'll probably do more boondocking than campgrounds, which will bring that cost down significantly. Yeah, no, absolutely. We are finally, finally back in Desert Snow, y'all. And there is a lot of organization that I need to do up in here. But today we're going to share with you the actual cost of our recent RV road trip, a 1700 mile RV road trip on the West Coast. Including our fuel costs and the cost of our RV parks and campgrounds. Whew. If you watched the last several episodes of our mini series up to the West Coast, you know we had a lot more space than uh, Desert Snow. Missed him terribly, but boy, my hips, I keep bumping into all these things on the oh you got oh boy there is definitely a lot of cleaning that has to be done up in here but i have to tell you so our rv life adventure the cost might surprise you but we're also going to share with you some of the highlights of our road trip some of the must visit places along the way and some important planning tips all right Let's get into it. We recently were on a 1700 mile road trip to Oregon for the Eclipse Fest near Crater Lake. Now our van, Desert Snow, was unfortunately stuck in the repair shop getting warranty repairs done. Fortunately, Blacksford RV Rentals provided us with a brand new 2023 Winnebago view for our two week trip. Ooh, and we were a little spoiled. Thanks, Blacksford. Ooh, we were definitely, definitely spoiled by having a lot more wiggle room in that view. And especially me loving that bathroom. It was like a luxury toilet. <laughs> yeah. It was a lot more Space, but it did definitely affect the type of camping we do. I mean, in Desert Snow, we do a ton of boondocking. Yeah. Right on this trip, we had this new rental. It wasn't really designed for boondocking. We aren't quite as comfortable with it. And so we were more conservative, stayed at campgrounds and RV resorts, which definitely increased the cost of the trip. Yeah, now that's not to say we don't love being back in Desert Snow, because boy, it's great to be back in our comfort zone here. But Dave is right. You know, we were afforded the opportunity to travel a little bit more campgroundy. And what's a good thing about that is not a lot of folks out there do do an extensive amount of boondocking. So this is a great way to kind of hone in and say, well, these are realistic expectations when you're traveling through the West Coast. All right, y'all, hope your bags are packed, got your snacks, because we're ready to take you on this adventure. Dave, kick it off. Okay, let's kick it off. So <laughs> we picked up our rig in Las Vegas and headed up to Lone Pine, California, which is actually absolutely stunning. We'll go into Lone Pine uh, a little bit later, but it was a 300 mile drive, right? And I'm gonna look right here. We actually, our, our first fill up was $106.07 and had to pay $6.20 a gallon. We ended up making our way into Lone Pine, California at an RV resort called Boulder Creek RV Resort. And it was absolutely amazing. So get a pin, write this down. A little expensive. It's about $85. Well, it is $85 a night. And we spent about $170 for two nights. But it's incredible. It's in this beautiful little town, little charm. And actually, we enjoyed this Western Film Festival at the uh, Film Festival Museum. Yeah, it was a nice surprise, too. We actually didn't know what was going on. Time We kind of stumbled into it. And it was amazing to take part of that. And you actually... Uh, met a son of a famous Western actor. He was handsome. It was Rod Cameron and his son. It was, well, his son, Rod Cameron passed away. But what history that place had. We caught it at the right time. Uh, we met some incredible people. And if you have not seen that episode, I believe it's episode two of our mini series we just released. Then the RV resort was very nice too. I loved how they had the free coffee and uh, muffins. muffins. Free coffee and muffins every morning. That was nice. And the muffins were homemade. Yeah, homemade muffins. Fresh muffins. Yeah, and, and, and I will say this is definitely a spot if we had been in desert snow we would have been off in alabama hills boondocking for free right you know, up in the boulders up there which by the way that campground was literally like five minutes right it was a definitely a difficult drive in certain parts but it was perfect if you want to get there and explore some of that history where a lot of movies were filmed up yeah. there for sure RVmattress.com is a Brooklyn bedded company known for its comfort and quality. Plus, they have an Arizona factory that ships to you for free anywhere in the U.S. They have quite a few options to choose from, offering different firmness options, height, and dimensions. Dave and I ordered two Dream Foam Essential mattresses in the 32 by 74 with a 6 inch height. And we've been using them now for a couple months. And let me tell you, it's a game changer in our sleep and in our morning attitudes. Dave and I felt we wanted something that was comfortable, durable, really to help us get a good night's sleep. Because you know I said it once and I'll say it again, getting a good night's sleep leads to a long, 
healthy marriage. You're welcome. What we like most about our mattresses is the comfort level and quality compared to our factory mattresses. Well, our factory mattresses weren't bad, but these, they just make you wanna sing. <laughs> Plus for us, because we do a lot of camping in the winter and the heat of summer, it's nice to have mattresses that are temperature controlled. Not too hot, not too cold. Plus they're affordable and high quality. A winning combination. With your RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding, you get a 120 sleep night trial. Plus a 10 year warranty. You can't beat that. And they'll deliver your mattress to your doorstep for free anywhere in the U.S. Visit rvmattress.com forward slash turnitupworld to enjoy an exclusive 25% off your mattress using the promo code turnitupworld. Oh, and be sure to explore all their outstanding sales throughout the month of November, which are going to be some of the biggest deals of the year, reaching up to 30% off. And thanks RV Matches by Brooklyn Bedding for supporting this channel. And we actually have a restaurant folks should check out in Lone Pine as well. There's a great restaurant called Seasons Restaurant. We also kind of stumbled upon a bit and we have some tips on that. I mean, I thought it was great. What do you think about Seasons? Ah, uh, yes, a tip for Seasons Restaurant. It's very important to get there 15 minutes early. If you do not have a reservation, you most likely will not be eating at that restaurant. It is that busy. So we were waiting about 15 minutes early in line, and by the time five o'clock came, for those that did not have a reservation, there was a pretty long line. And so what we tend to do, and what we would recommend, is head for the bar. And that is just, in our opinion, one of the coolest places to really meet some of the locals, as well as as folks that may have visited Lone Pine and that area quite a bit. It was awesome. Yeah, it was amazing. And actually, you met a former Disney cartoonist. Yes. And that was a really fun experience. Oh my gosh. Again, if you have not seen that video, I would recommend go checking that out. I am going to frame. He was a cartoonist. He drew Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore. And I was really, really excited to get some notes that are attached to that, which go <laughs> take a look at that video. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> now, after Lone Pine, we headed up uh, 250 miles north to a place we wanted to visit for a long time, of course, Virginia City, <gasps> Oh my Nevada. gosh, that was amazing. We spent like three days there. That yes. was so awesome. Yeah, it was great. And actually, along the way, I should mention this, along the way, we filled up near Virginia City, our diesel, and we spent about $96 for that fill up. And it was cheaper because we were in Nevada. It was $5.14 a gallon. Now, the place we stayed is Virginia City RV Park. What was great about that park was the fact that it was walking distance to all the action right in that cute little old town. And I believe we paid, what was it, $7? 75 bucks a night? Yeah, no, I think that's right. It was about $75 a night. Yeah, so, so for three nights, that's a whopping $225.75. So now, what can we tell them about Virginia City? Well, first up, we went to Virginia City in a slower period, so we yeah. understand during the peak time, the crowds can be just Crazy. overwhelming, right? So luckily for us, it really was not too busy in that regard, but our first big tip is definitely go and or contact the visitor center yes. there. The visitor center in Virginia City is amazing. They were super helpful to us they tell you all the activities that are currently going on that day right they have a list of everything going on that day and the prices now some of the highlights we really enjoyed in virginia city that we think you would really enjoy is like the fourth ward museum the school it's a one-of-a-kind architecture and when i say it's a one-of-a-kind architecture it doesn't exist anymore it's the only one of its kind according to the director and we actually had a wonderful tour by the director of the school so we learned a lot of inside and, and tips and information about that school that we think you'd appreciate. And then we made our way over to the Collar Mine, which was another fun thing to do, right? I oh, know, it was very cool. Now, if you're claustrophobic, you, you may not enjoy it. That's true. I have a little bit of claustrophobia. Yeah. But we still went in there, right? Got a little scared, but kept on going. Yeah, but he's right. like also six foot two. Oh, yeah. And so when you're in that mine, oh, yeah. there's no standing up. You gotta almost walk as if you're going on your knees and you're walking through the mud. But don't take our word for it. You can actually check that episode out as well. But I will say, one of the cool things about doing this, you guys, is it supports the local local business there. You know, when this, they get a lot of snow, a lot of snow. So when there's heavy snow, I'm sure a lot of those businesses tend to shut down. So if you're visiting, go ahead, do those, I call them tourist things, but you learn a lot about the community and actually what went on in that small haunted town. Right, and plus <laughs> it, was a, it was a massive silver find there too. I mean, they've had obviously large gold finds, oh. but also a huge silver find, huge. and that was the color mine. It's, it's amazing history. Now, you guys also know we're foodies, so I have to point out this place. It's a small family-owned restaurant that's 
very popular called The Cider Factory. And boy, oh boy, the energy of that waitress. Uh, we met the son, it's a mom and son operation. And when they first came into town, it was the family operation, but the husband passed away. So the mom and son are kind of taking over to get, took it over. And they do a fantastic job. It's got this old school charm with some dynamite food. And we drove about 250 miles along the way to Trailer Lane Campground. It was yes. just a stop, just a one night stopover for us. Now along the way, we did fill up some more diesel. It was $104 for the fill up and we're back in California so the price went up to six dollars and ten cents a gallon yeah and that is cray cray now the cost for that overnight at trailer lane campground was sixty two dollars and seventy cents and there's a couple things I need to point out about this campground it's a small campground but it's amazing if you want to get some work done they use for their Wi-Fi service they use Starlink now I'm not sure if it's the business plan but something about that Starlink it was screaming yeah, it was high the download and upload were just well over anything I have ever seen from our Starlink and we were able to get some work done uploading videos getting things transferred it was great to be able to to get all that done without a beat and it didn't take us long at all there were some really beautiful views of Mount Shasta right oh the views are were absolutely stunning I mean Mount Shasta is such a beautiful mountain it is right and that that drive was beautiful but we were, we were just 110 miles away from Eclipse Fest I know. And so it was a quick drive for us. Uh, we actually did not have to fill up. So no fill up during this leg, but we got to Eclipse Fest. We were boondocking there for three nights. You heard right, boondocking. But I have to tell you, it was not expensive huh? to boondock for those three days. 90... Not cheap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that version was not cheap. <laughs> it was definitely Thank not cheap. Thank you for the correction, because it was not. It was like $91 and like 75 cents. It or was, like that. exactly. And we were there for three nights nights yeah. and that was just boondocking for those three nights which was a little over 275. We met just some amazing folks and also saw some old friends too there and it was just great spending time again with both our friends and meeting all the new ones. Now in addition to seeing the eclipse one of the highlights was definitely seeing Crater Lake for our first time. Oh my gosh. That was an incredible experience. It really was and a big thank you to Raul and Crystal for allowing us since we didn't have a tow behind to use their pickup truck which is awesome. It was like just rolling rolling and we got to explore you know from the west to the east rim so all the way around crater lake and there was snow so yeah. it was just a little icing on the cake for us was it worth going out to the eclipse fest it was super expensive if, if it were not for meeting all the great people i would say hey we'll just go up that way and find a place to boondock and kind of watch it on our own yeah right don't necessarily need you know the, the whole festival in, in my opinion but meeting everyone that's what made it so worth it absolutely we moved on continuing our journey it was actually a 315 mile drive to washu lake state park which is near between Reno and Carson City, mm -hmm. Nevada. Beautiful. And and because it was such a long drive, we had to fill fill up two times. <laughs> we really said two times. So the first fill up was in Oregon, mm -hmm. and it was uh, seventy three dollars and seventy seven cents at five fifty eight a gallon. Mm -hmm. And the second fill up was when we got down to Reno. It was ninety nine dollars and seventy seven cents for five dollars and forty eight cents a gallon. Again, we stayed at Washoe Lake State Park for two nights. It was thirty dollars a night, total of sixty bucks. The hosts that work there currently, they do a great job at yeah. making sure each spot is accommodating to the guests checking in clean and we it's just interesting what we paid obviously it's 30 bucks a night but that was because we were using full hookups and water and one thing about the lake it is murky water so don't yeah. expect anything like lake tahoe which no. is crystal clear but this is campground is a great spot to stop for a few nights between yeah. here going near you know, reno or, or carson city <laughs> then we drove a whopping 470 miles y'all headed back towards las vegas ended up at the railroad pass hotel yeah. and casino at a great truck stop there but gotta say along the way we had two fill up first one was for 84 dollars and 74 cents it was five dollars and nine cents a gallon mm -hmm. second one was 79 dollars and 48 cents and 4.94 a gallon now i have to say i wasn't sure about how it would work out us kind of overnighting we were exhausted in a basically a truck stop and it worked out beautifully we connected with the folks inside both the casino as well as the travel center that gave us instructions on where we as RVers could camp because we wanted to make sure we respected the truckers positions they drive insane amount of hours so we wanted to respect that and it felt really comfortable I love the fact that there was a convenience store right there a casino right there 
and some uh, some great options for food. Yeah, it's really they had the Capriotis. Yeah. And the travels had a great sandwiches. And plus, pro tip: if you're staying there, make sure you sign up for a player's card. <gasps> yes. Right, because we got actually a free uh, bacon and egg breakfast in the morning because of the player's card. What is the grand total of this two-week RV adventure? Tell them what it is. Okay, please. here we go. <laughs> Bring out the calculators, right? Okay, so diesel costs. Yes. Fill up the rig for the entire 1,700-mile trip. It was six hundred forty-three dollars and twenty-four cents. The cost for our camping, RV parks, or campgrounds, total there was actually, and it's 12 nights total, $792.20. Yeah, I would say that's still not terrible. Try doing that for like 12 nights in Vegas, that'll cost you several mortgage payments. Exactly. So I'm just saying, that's not a terrible deal. Right, yeah, the average cost, 66 bucks a night. So, yeah. you know, not terrible, not super cheap either. This is a realistic expectation of cost, so. There it is. Are you an avid adventurer who loves the freedom of the open roads? Well, we are. So if you're currently traveling in a camper van or an RV, or if you're thinking about embarking on a journey, well, there are a few crucial safety considerations you better keep in mind. Now, while the RV life offers incredible flexibility and a chance to explore the world on your own terms, there are some serious dangerous habits that can be putting your safety or the safety of others at risk. So today, we're gonna share with you seven dangerous things you should never do in your camper van or RV. As a matter of fact, you might be doing some of these right now and you better stop. Let's get into it. Okay, so a lot of you might be wondering, where, where the heck are you guys? Well, we are at this beautiful RV resort in Las Vegas. We figured why not come outside and sit poolside and talk about this. But I have to say something really quick. You know, we are definitely guilty of some of these dangerous habits ourselves. I'm just saying. No, no, that's true. We're making some confessions today. Yeah, we definitely are. So this way we can feel like we're all in this together. <laughs> all right, so let's kick things off with one, overloading your camper van. Now, I know we are all guilty of this. You know, it might be tempting to think about packing everything and the kitchen sink as you embark on your journey. But seriously, overloading your RV or camper van can be seriously dangerous, right? No, it's very very true and as Tanya said it and we're guilty of this as well. When we moved into desert snow, I mean, it's a small camper van, right? It's Ford Transit chassis, 23 feet long. And we're trying to bring our comforts of home with us on the road. And so my first instinct is like, pack everything as we can, get everything in the garage you can, as much as you can in there. You tried your best and you were wrong. Then you realize, especially when you load up and fill up your water tanks and all that, that you could very well be overweight, right? Absolutely. So you really wanna be conscious of that. Be careful, because it has a real impact on the driving and your braking and all that. And one of the huge things too is by overloading your RV, you don't only risk yourselves and your lives, but you might risk others on the road as well. Next up, driving faster than the tires on your RV are rated. Wow, this is very true. I can't even count the times. We've seen rigs going by at high speeds. A lot of times it's like towables or fifth wheels are really small tires yeah. on them. You know they aren't rated for very high, maybe not over 65, and they're going like 85 80. miles an hour. And yeah. it may be within the speed limit in some places, but it's over the tire rating of those tires. That's a real safety risk. Yeah, and just imagine pairing that with a possible overweight rig on top of that. Oh, that's a recipe for disaster. Next up, ignoring propane safety and driving with the propane on. Now this one is a bit controversial, which actually is a bit surprising to us. We feel it's very important to turn the propane off when you're driving. Now, in our rig, it doesn't make any sense to have it on anyway, right? It's really just the heat, and we have a system that we can actually keep our tanks from freezing while we're driving, Yes. right? Whereas I know others, propane can actually heat the fridge, which is a tougher decision on whether to turn it off or not. Cool the, it's cool the fridge. <laughs> oh, I said heat the fridge, yeah? Cool the fridge. Cool the fridge. Cool the fridge. Yeah, of course, cool the fridge. Yes. Right, and so some people will drive with it, but we just think as a safety measure you should really drive with your propane off close off the tanks sort of heading down the road oh there's one other thing about propane we should mention and we've had since this times we're in rv parks sometimes the smell of propane could actually mean there's a propane leak that's important to check that right no absolutely make sure you check your lines make sure everything is secure that you don't have any propane leaks that can definitely be dangerous oh and i just have to mention if you hear some of that whistling noise going on at the moment well it's because we have to share this spot with some cicadas and you know how those little buggers once they start rubbing those legs or whatever they do it just we need some grackles exactly they're everywhere they're <laughs> everywhere driving with unsecured items 
let me first start off by saying we are definitely, you know, uh, contributors of doing that. You know, sometimes when you're packing up pretty quickly or you, you forget to secure certain things or if you don't actually realize you haven't secured something until you get into an accident. And yes, we were just in a recent collision with our RV Desert Snow. And if you're not familiar with that video, you may go ahead and check it out on a video we put together to get more information on that. But I'm talking about in particular our Berkey system. Yes. You know, our Berkey system, the bottom was secure, the top wasn't necessarily secure right. and when we actually got into our collision the Berkey system just went flying right up to the front seat and everything got wet yeah and it was scary we weren't going fast at all and you can imagine if you were traveling pretty quickly I mean, things could be just like projectiles flying through there. So you really want to do, take some time to think about, okay, is everything secure? I mean, the obvious things are like things on the wall, right? Like paintings and pictures and things. But like that Berkey, we didn't realize that. That went flying. Oh, it went flying. And that was uh, a little scary. Drinking from your fresh water tank without any filters. Now this topic sparks a little bit of controversy for sure, right? No, it does. We've had comments saying, oh, I've been drinking out of my water tank for like 20 years, no problem. But I mean, the water's just sitting in that tank and it can actually get bacteria pretty easily. So we think it's very important to make sure you're filtering your water with a good filtration system. We actually have multiple filters in ours. We One do, from it goes pump. from the pump, yeah. then it goes to the RV, and yeah. then it goes into the Berkey, exactly. and then it goes from the Berkey into the bottle, and it goes from the bottles into my mouth. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> done, done. Dun! Not using a surge protector, y'all. Now, one thing I can say for sure is that not all campground currents are equal. You don't know what you're getting when you're plugging into that system, you know? So you gotta be really cautious about that. And sometimes plugging directly into that power supply could blow everything in your RV. Yeah, no, it's just very- Costly. Exactly, <laughs> it's very good safety practice. Always use a surge protector, just protect your rig. Last thing you wanna do is get some strange surge coming in, right, from the, the RV or wherever you're plugged in. And because of that, that goes into your system and blows everything, that's gonna be very expensive. Absolutely, and you know what? It costs a lot less just to buy, what, a $200 surge protector? That could cost you thousands of dollars in repair. Right, plus it could be hazardous, cause a fire. So just avoid that. Disregarding weather warnings. You know what? Weather conditions can change all the time, right, babe? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and certainly, I mean, I've been guilty of not staying on top of the weather, especially with some of our winter camping. We've been caught. I've been guilty yeah, too. <laughs> yeah, we've been caught in, in blizzards, and obviously it can be very dangerous, not just blizzards, about to say high wind situation if you're driving your rig down the road it's super windy that can be a really dangerous situation driving down the road with a big rig getting tossed around by the wind absolutely and that's just really goes to show being attuned to the weather and you can't prepare for that all the time we understand there's certain times where you're actually driving into a storm that might be coming at you it's just uh be precautious be safe and take your time in those type of conditions now babe we have some really important bonus things that you should never do in your rv that we should really mention you know you're absolutely right and not only are these bonus ones we should mention, but they're true safety concerns and possibly could damage your RV if you're not paying attention to them. So let's get into it. Like driving down really bumpy roads. Do with me, bumpy roads. Oh, okay. Now this one we're definitely guilty of, right? You're driving your home down the road and most of these RVs and even some of the camper vans aren't designed for going down and just shaking your, your house around like crazy. Yeah. You know, the, the lines are gonna loosen up, the bolts, the screws, all that stuff. And you gotta go through and check out, you might get water leaks from that. So if you can avoid it, don't go down bumpy roads because that's gonna really do a lot of damage to your RV. Yeah, and sometimes you can't avoid it. Like for us, for instance, we love the boondocking line. Yeah. Not only do we enjoy the campgrounds, but we love getting off into some, you know, more isolated areas and a lot of times those type of roads do require you to go down some washboards and bumps. The views are there. Just mentally prepare yourself that you most likely will have to be in the repair shop after that trip. Yeah. <laughs> Leaving your awning out when you're not around. Oh, I have to tell the story on this one. So we were this close from losing our awning and we were actually there. But you know what? When your awning is out, you never know what could happen. For instance, we had a potential, we call them dust devils, where just randomly, like a little mini cyclone just comes up and boom, it could completely rip your awning off. So we do realize as we're out traveling, whenever we're leaving the RV, we tend to put it on again, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's even true if your awning has that automatic retractable feature, which ours does. It does. But if a, if a strong wind comes through, like it can in the, the Vegas area in particular, I mean, that awning can, can break pretty easily. I mean, RV awnings are notorious for breaking. Oh yeah. So, so be careful and put it in before you leave. Absolutely. You know, you don't want your awning ending up in your neighbor's backyard. Now this one might apply to those that be, you know, like us that do enjoy winter camping, but it's not paying attention to temperatures overnight, especially during those cold winters. 
And this is especially true when you're changing seasons, right? Oh, and yeah. the days might be a little bit warmer, but the nights go down and you get these freeze warnings. And this happened to us, right? We actually- Several times. Well, we actually, <laughs> at one time we actually, we didn't put our heat on and the temperature got below freezing and actually froze a couple of our pipes, which was super frustrating. We came back yeah, to the rig. Yeah, we yeah, came back to the rig. We had a leak in the rig and had to get it fixed. Towing a vehicle over the tow rate capacity of your rig. No, no, no! Now we actually don't tow a vehicle, but we've seen more situations where there might be even like a small SUV or something towing this huge thing behind it. And we know our capacity very well, it's 4,000 pounds. A lot of things we'd like to tow, we actually wouldn't be able to in our rig. But it's very important, again, this gets back to the whole weight of your vehicle, the combined weight of that and what you're towing. Just be careful, stay within the capacity of your tow, you know, your tow capacity. Draining the gray water, y'all on the ground. No, no, no! You shouldn't dump your gray water you know, out on the ground. Now we know in some BLM areas it may be legal to do so. Yeah. Don't dump your gray water. Plus, babe, I mean, it smells. It does, right? ours does. You know, I do a lot of cooking inside and outside of the rig. So when I'm washing dishes, whether it's from meat or seafood, the gray water tends to have a smell. I mean, yeah. would you really want that dumped on your campground? So you gotta be really careful and be mindful of that. Like, would you want your stinky gray water dripped all over your ground? No, probably not. So don't do it to others. Don't dump them on the ground. Now, we don't have a black tank, but leaving the black tank open while you're connected to the sewer? Mm -mm -mm. Now, I know a lot of you probably know this, but full hookup black tank valves must be closed, y'all. Keep them closed when you're hooked up to that sewer line. Right, no, it's pretty nasty. I mean, the fumes from the line can come up back right into the RV. And plus, if you have it open all the time, your fluids are gonna kind of go down, right? But the solids might create this poop pyramid and that can be a real problem for you. Think of it like wall plaster. <laughs> exactly. Once it gets hard, it gets hard. It's hard to get it off, but poopy stop. <laughs> exactly, so if you're connected, if you have a sewer connected, keep the black tank one closed and just open it when you're draining it. Now, sometimes in a rush, we all forget this, but it's really important to check and maintain the tire pressure or checking the tires on a regular basis. Now that's really true, right? I mean, obviously our camper van is like 10,000 pounds, right? And some of these bigger RVs are much heavier than that. Much so these, these tires are carrying a lot of pressure. So it's super important to make sure that your tire pressure is right. And also that the tires aren't worn. They can get worn down pretty quickly. Oh yeah, and imagine if you have dualies, how much more important is it so that they're not actually rubbing? And sometimes if the pressure, you oh, know yeah. how it goes, gets lower, those puppies will rub. Exactly. Therefore causing some big problems. This is an important one, especially if you're a pet owner and pet lover. Not your system working, especially especially if you're gonna be away from your RV. We travel with our two cats, Bailey and Brady, and for us, those are our kiddos. So it's very important when we're going off hiking uh, to make sure we have proper temperature monitoring systems, right? Like we have the Waggle, for instance, and we even have others that will sync right. to our Starlink or other devices that has its own sort of GPS because you never know. So I always say the more the merrier if you're gonna be camping in really warm condition areas, right? No, absolutely. So that's when we'll know like how important for us is to have those monitoring systems exactly. but it, it's just it's truly life-saving for us and definitely our four-legged friends not knowing the height of your rv important important <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this one's super important it quite often is referred to as say an rv newbie mistake but it can be a mistake for all of us you get a new rig you gotta know the height of your rv if you're driving down you know say back roads you see kind of a low tunnel you're going through or something a low overhang you don't want to question last thing you want to do is of course like take off the top and suddenly you're in a convertible yeah 100 <laughs> percent. i always say this Whatever the height of your rig is, just give it a little bit more. Justify Absolutely. a little bit more and say it's a little bit higher mentally. So that's always in the back of your mind. So whenever you are going through the tunnels, like Dave said, you don't end up with a convertible. Okay, now this one, you guys, this one happens to more folks than you can imagine. Packing up too quickly when you're about to leave a campground or your boondocking site. Oh, especially without having a checklist. Guilty sometimes, yeah. Oh, I mean, probably all of us <laughs> are guilty on this one. And uh, yeah, it's super important. Go through your checklist. Make sure you, kind of, you have your things you're going through. I have, I have things I'm going through. And if you forget something, suddenly you're going down the road and you know maybe you've forgotten to do something. Something's like rattling or I forgot to do something outside. Time, get it done. Stay focused on what you're doing and do everything right on as you break down to hit the road. Absolutely well said. High five. All right. Baby. You can do is actually get, get what's called a skirt. Our boy Desert Snow, and he's such a good boy. It's not too cold, it's called a poop popsicle. I too hate sweaty walls. Tanya's technique for getting rid of the grackles. Grackles! <laughs>
Preparing your camper van for a winter RV life can be a real challenge and certainly varies depending on the rig you have. Now we've been living in our Winnebago Echo for Desert. Snow. For over a year, we've been in the snow a lot. We've learned a lot. And we're gonna share our experiences with you and also tips that will apply not just to our Winnebago Echo, but to your rig as well. So that is the name of our RV, Desert Snow. And it's because we're from Boston as well as Las Vegas. And while we do love spring and summer RVing, we enjoy winter camping as well, right babe? Oh man, there is nothing quite like winter camping, whether it's that winter campfire in the snow, whether it's going off snowshoeing, whether it's going off like crazy sledding, or even hot tent camping. We've had so much fun. Yes, so that's exactly right. And today we're gonna share with you how we prepare our camper van for winter RV camping. But it's not exactly what you think. And just real quick, you may hear some planes going overhead because we are camping right now, right next to the Las Vegas airport, getting ready before we head off into the mountains. Oh, and don't think you snowbirds that this information doesn't apply to you as well because winter is coming for all of us. Hey babe, let's talk about a cold wind in the winter, what that means for rigs, oh, right? Okay. That can really make it cold pretty quickly, especially yes, kind of coming indeed. down here. It's, it's, if you have wind blowing under the rig, kind of getting up underneath, even though the Echo is insulated, there's still some weakness underneath. You can feel that cold a little bit in some places. And so what you can do is actually get, get what we call a skirt. And it's, it will, a skirt? A skirt, that's right. And it's basically an insulated, piece of fabric that you basically button all around the rig to stop that wind flow from coming under uh, under your rig. And now we haven't done that yet. Maybe we'll do that. If we start doing some really extreme cold weather camping, right, for a long time, we'll probably get ourselves a skirt as well. Now, many RVers would consider draining their water pipes and their tanks in the winter to prevent them from freezing. Many going as far as putting in some RV antifreeze. We don't have to do that for a couple of reasons. Well, first, and I will say this, our boy Desert Snow, and he's such a good boy, all of his water tanks and lines are behind these thick insulated walls and floors, which really helps to prevent them from freezing. But also, behind these insulated walls, our water control panel, our garage space, it all has ducted heat, which allows us to go off grid in the cold weather for extensive amount of times without any freezing. But speaking of which, inside this garage, if we were at a campground and we had an insulated hose and we wanted to plug up to the water, we can certainly do that, um, but we don't. And a couple reasons why, we have a 50 gallon fresh, so we fill it up, but we do quite a bit more boondocking than in campgrounds. So with that being said, we don't need it. Now many RVs have what's called single pane windows and those will bleed heat incredibly. They are not uh, very well insulated at all. And you'll see people actually putting up insulation barriers over those windows, which can actually block all the light into the rig, which is kind of depressing. But what we have here is actually dual pane windows, which is very different. I said dual pane windows, oh, oh, oh. dual pane, That's dual pane. You. Oh wait. Dual pane windows, hi. Um, yeah, as you can see, they're dual, um, nice and dually, which uh, allows us to not only enjoy the outside and bring in some of that natural light, but it also allows me to close this to keep you out of my dirty kitchen. Get out of my, get out, get out of my kitchen, but we love dual pain. Dave, tell them more about the dual pain life. Well, that's all there is to say about that. What's up next on the agenda? Now, have you ever enjoyed a, just a wonderful popsicle in the winter? It's too cold for popsicles in the winter. I prefer like yeah. hot cocoa. Well, it's not, well, that actually is kind of relevant. It's not too cold Ew. for what's called a poop popsicle. Here, let me show you. Ew, a poop popsicle? Like, why do I need to see a poop popsicle? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, fortunately, you probably won't, won't have to at all, but actually a common problem that you can run into when you're winter camping in traditional rigs, if you basically assume this is, now we don't have a black tank, and we'll talk about that later, but this is our gray tank drain. And many times this is what will be behind insulated walls like it is here, but this can freeze up, right? And cause a lot of damage. But another issue is that if you actually connect your black tank to the drain in the winter, that that actual uh, pipe can actually freeze up as well and crack and also create like frozen, Ew. whatever, like poop popsicles in there as well. So you don't wanna do that. If you're gonna camp and you have a black tank, don't stay hooked up to the drain pipe in the winter months. Just just drain it when you, you know, hook it up when you're draining it and then put it back after you're finished draining. Now, of course, babe, you know we don't have a black tank, yep. right? 
right? We have this wonderful cassette toilet behind this insulated wall, which is convenient for us. But what do you call this thing again? It's your toilet suitcase. That's right, portable toilet suitcase. And I see you can just kind of take this out and you can dump this anywhere. You, what? What? You can't dump it anywhere. Where, where, where can you really dump it? Because you don't want people thinking that we dump it on the ground. Yeah, no, 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 no. Time out. <laughs> no, of course, we don't do that at all. But, you know, any toilet, porta potty, of course, RV park, places like that, rest area. There's a lot of convenience here in the cassette. You can dump it in many places. All right, so really quick for those of you wondering, well, how do we survive with that tiny cassette toilet off boondocking for, say, a couple of weeks? Well, I have in that garage space right over there, hidden right over there. In that garage space, I have a tent and a princess toilet along with a couple of lovely disposable bags where we can then, once we get off to the next spot, go ahead and just dump them. So it's a convenient way to stay off grid and enjoy yourself without being out of luck. <laughs> Phew! Oh my goodness gracious. Did you just fart? No, I did not fart. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> that, that's someone's releasing the black tank, I think, somewhere. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now for those with other rigs, and if you have a black tank, certainly let us know in the comments below how you handle your black tank during the cold winter months. Just pause this video right now. Go ahead down there, leave a comment and let yeah. us know. And then come on back and continue right where you left off. We'll see you in a second. All right, so quick story time. So when Dave and I first got Desert Snow, we were definitely excited about going off and doing some winter camping. And we're talking about places where the temperature was gonna get down to the single digits. So yes, it's a brand new RV. They do ensure that it's got great insulation, but you never know it's an R RV. So for our comfortability, we just wanted to make sure those compartments were actually being heated uh, and sustaining temperatures way above freezing. So we ended up getting this. Ta-da! They're called temp sticks. So we got a couple of these temperature sticks and we placed them in various places around the RV. And the biggest reason for us doing that was it allowed us to monitor the temperature via Wi-Fi. So even away from the RV, we were able to check the temperatures on a frequent basis to know what the readings were. Now you will have to have some sort of Wi-Fi connection in your RV for them to work, but they work amazing. And if you're curious about learning more of this, we do have a link in our Amazon store below where you can learn more about these temp sticks. But for us, they work really well. And we have three and we love them. Now we do have a small dirty secret. We have a small base heater, which we do use on occasion. I gotta admit, when it gets really cold, sometimes up here in the transit side of the Echo, it gets a bit drafty. So we may have the space heater to kind of warm up this area a little bit, but you'd never want to just rely on the space heater to heat the whole rig. You need to use the rig's heater. As we talked about before, that heat warms the compartments that are kind of maintaining, you know, the water and everything else from not freezing. All right, babe, it's time for a little bit of a game changer winter RV camping talk. You ready for that? Oh, the game changer, the RV game changer. And you know what we're talking about? What are we talking about? Well, we are talking about our heating system, both the heater and the hot water, right? We have the AquaGo for the water heat. What do we got for the heat inside? The Vario heat on exactly. the inside. Right, the Truma Vario heat. And we've found that these systems are just unbelievably efficient. Of course, they run off propane. We have two 20 pound propane tanks. We found that after eight nights last winter in 15 degree weather, we ran the heater constantly for those eight nights. We only used three quarters of one of the tanks. That's right. And that was awesome. That was I mean, awesome. That is incredibly efficient. And the it's, other was full. I know, exactly, it exactly. It's unbelievable. And so, I mean, it's incredibly efficient, incredibly quiet. We're toasty inside, so it's pretty yeah, darn it, good. Definitely not sponsored, but hey, Truma, you know, let us know. But uh, yeah, it's not sponsored. But one thing we did add on this one, you don't want to drive with the propane on. And one concern we had was, well, if the propane's not on, is there a risk of the aqua go actually freezing Go if you're driving down really cold, wet through really cold weather with nothing on here? Because there is water that's quite close here, as you can see. Uh, so we've added in, Truma provides this, uh, effectively an electric antifreeze system. So that's in here, so the propane will be off, but the antifreeze electric system prevents any freezing. Yeah, and Dave did a great job installing that. And if you're driving down the road in the freezing cold, there is a preventative measure, right? Well, yeah, well, when you set this up, I mean, you go inside and you actually turn on the, the system, but you do need to kind of put this in here as well so the air won't kind of cut back in. So it's kind of put that in here. And close it close up. Close it up. And you'll see right there, you know it's right when it's sticking through there and you're good to go. But you gotta turn it off first before you do that. So what am I doing here? <laughs> no, it is already off. Oh uh, my goodness, uh, it's off. Uh, Look see, at it, I did it right. Nature. I did it Perfect. right. High five. But we don't need this right now. High five. <laughs>
So before we get into this next part, which I feel is a really important piece as to why we truly enjoy off-grid camping and camping in winter in desert snow is a bonus tip and that has to do with propane and some of you B classers or van lifers may not have it but a lot of RVs still have propane and rely, rely on propane for cooking maybe even your heating things of that nature so for us having such a smaller rig uh, we like to preserve our propane and and the way we do that is by not using it when we don't have to such as cooking so I'm gonna show you really quick I have a single burner induction portable cooktop. And for me, it's really important. I love to cook. And so instead of wasting the propane, which we like to use and preserve for the hot water and the heat, I tend to use my induction cooktop. And if you don't have one, they're very easy to find. You can find them anywhere. As a matter of fact, I love to cook. So if you haven't seen any of our videos, when I'm cooking some food, you should go check them out because I can cook up a main store. Right, Dave? Oh man, you cook amazing <laughs> food, baby. Amazing. Oh. Uh, no, I mean it though. You do. You're so, the best. You're awesome, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so really quick about the propane, one last piece is one great thing that we have is a monitoring system for the propane tank so we know what the levels are before we actually start heading to our destination. Uh, our Mopeka system, they attach right onto the bottom of the propane tanks. You can use either the monitor that's in the RV or you can use it via app and we find that to be very efficient and a uh, peace of mind, especially if you're gonna be winter camping. Well, welcome to our bedroom area. And I feel it's a great opportunity for us to talk about sweaty walls. Oh, I love sweaty walls. I know you like sweaty walls. Nothing Delicious. like a sweaty ball. <laughs> sweaty balls. Good times. Mm. Good times. Mm. I hate sweaty walls, especially in an RV. All right, we are talking about condensation. Now, I know a lot of us in the RV community have dealt with or may still be dealing with condensation and the way we especially in a smaller RV try to prevent that condensation from happening is we do a couple things one we open up our max uh, vent fan give it just a crack to allow circulation of airflow out in that direction we have a small fan that we'll sometimes use if need be but our game changer when it comes to condensation is a small dehumidifier you talking about this <laughs> A small dehumidifier yes I mean for us some folks will use the traditional size ones but because we have such a small rig uh, an RV we have to accommodate and so we have a small dehumidifier and let me tell you that puppy comes in handy uh, especially during those winter months so we're really excited to you know get out there and explore and soak up that moisture in the dehumidifier and not on my walls because I, and so does Bray Bray, right Bray Bray? I too hate sweaty walls. Oh God, I hate sweaty walls, especially if there's no catnip involved. Do you hear all those grackles? Gotta say hi to the grackles. The grackles are everywhere. Grackles are speaking to us. They're in the trees. L listen, listen. I just hope they don't crap on the rig. I know, we just got them washed. They might. Can you sing? Oh no, they're all coming in. Oh look, look at them. Oh boy. Oh boy. We're gonna have some crap up there with those solar panels. Don't you dare say that. All right. Well, they're still serenading us, those, those <laughs> grackles. <laughs> won't let them. But we need to talk about one more feature of our RV that was super important to us, is super important to us, and that, of course, is all wheel drive. We do a lot of driving on snow covered roads, you know, ice, mud. Exactly, mud <laughs> as well. Traction has been great. We have a lot of confidence in driving this thing. Super important. And plus, we actually just, just did, oh, hot yeah, off the presses, a, a absolute major mod. And we're gonna cover that in an upcoming video. So hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for that. My goodness gracious. Tanya's technique for getting rid of the grackles. You have a better way. I think you should kind of yell it up. Grackle! 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 <laughs> That's not working. <laughs> Wait, I'm afraid they're gonna poop me, Dave. Seriously, it's like he's flying my head. The story of the grackles. So since you're hanging out with Dave and myself and the grackles this long, there's a couple quick bonuses I want to share with you. Even if it's the winter, you don't always have to sit inside and be stuck in the warmth. 
you can also take that warmth on the outside. And a couple quick things that we enjoy. One here is our propane fire pit. Whether you're using a individual 20 pound propane tank that you may carry an extra one, for us, we have a quick connect that we tend to connect directly to our RV, which is very, very handy. Sit around the fire and have a couple drinks. Now, there's a, another thing that we like to use, which is a fire pit. Our basically, it's called a solo fire pit. And for us, it's very, very efficient. We get a couple stacks of wood and we can go through those very, very slowly because of the efficiency of this stove. So we really do enjoy that getting outside and enjoying some of nature, mm -hmm. even in the winter months, right? Exactly, enjoy the campfire. I love the winter campfire. And with this roll, I can make s'mores. Who doesn't love s'mores in the winter? I'm hungry. I love s'mores in the winter. Actually, I can go for some s'mores right now. <laughs> I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> I like that steak and s'mores. First time for everything. Okay. Ew, oh my God, ew. I think I forgot to close the flap. Oh. You know what? That's why this is Dave's job. Yep, that's why it's my job. But should you be aware of the cassette toilet? We have been living with a cassette toilet now for six months in our new Winnebago Echo. And today we're going to give you our brutally honest review, including the number one most asked question we receive like this. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. What is that? What's what? That thing in your hand right there. Oh, well, my wife likes to call it my toilet suitcase. Okay, okay, it may not be the most frequently asked question, but folks do ask it a lot because I gotta say that cassette toilet is an eye catcher. There has been so many mixed emotions and feelings when it comes to having a cassette toilet, including Dave and myself when we decided to purchase our Winnebago Echo. But we've quickly learned how much we've appreciated having the cassette toilet. Now we're also gonna be talking about our likes and dislikes, but not just that why the pros for us definitely outweigh the cons when it comes to having a cassette toilet for full-time RV living. And whoo, the desert sun is hot. You need some seltzer, honey. First and foremost, I switched up to a little high noon. High noon. <laughs> a little hard seltzer. Mm, so I got a secret for you. <laughs> oh! You did too. Double trouble. Mm, that's nice, gotta have one of those. Mm. But let's address the horse in the stables. <laughs> the cat in the room. Cat in the hat? Cat in the, cat in the hat. Elephant in the room? Yes, the elephant in the room. And that is how easy or how hard is it to deal or live with a cassette toilet? Well, let me show you. Come on over here a second. I want to show you how easy it is to basically take the cassette in and out of the Echo. So we kind of pop this open and the cassette's right in here. And you'll see there's a little latch you just kind of lift up here at the bottom, a blue latch, and it slides right out. Now, one thing I do like to do is make sure that this is actually closed. So I kind of push that in as well because it can leak there but uh, then we kind of bring this out right on down you can either carry it or if you want to roll it bring this right up pop it in and boom there you go wow this cassette toilet is so easy just take this top right off just like that voila all right now one thing important make sure this is a pressure release valve right there you got to hit that otherwise maybe a little kickback all right so hit that button in there and then here we go Right down there, right down. There it goes. Oh, there it goes. Shake it all around. And that's all there is to it. Just gotta rinse it out a little bit after. All right, then kind of put a little water in, rinse it. You gotta shake it up. Make sure everything's tight though when you shake. That's all there is to it. Then you empty that, that out. You're good to go. Hey babe. Yeah. You ready to film this video? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm just getting the cassette toilet ready for action. Well, at least that's your job. Yeah, you make it look so easy, my dear, and that's why that's all on you. <laughs> Thanks, babe. <laughs> well, we also get, the, one of the major questions we get asked to is where the heck can you dump this thing? Right, and that's actually something we love about it. It's really the flexibility of the cassette toilet, yes. right? Yes. And you can actually, I mean, we're in an RV park today, so you can actually dump it just down, right, the normal kind of waste receptacle they have at the RV parks, but you can go into the toilet, and if you're on the road, rest areas, right? Um, porta potties. Porta potties, or really just many different spots along the way. Uh, but certainly be careful when you go into those places. You don't want to make a mess, right? You want to be very careful. Make sure you follow the instructions and, and do it carefully. Right, that's probably the main thing is follow the instructions. So yeah. one, you don't make a mess in the area, and two, you don't make a mess of yourself. <laughs> yes, very good. That is definitely a positive, especially for, you know, someone like us where we really enjoy sort of that combination of parks and boondocking 
you know, being able to go off grid a little bit more. So having that flexibility allows us not have to go and find, you know, a place to constantly have right. the dump, like a dump station. But on the other hand, it is pretty small and including the one we have. No, yeah, exactly. It's, it's pretty small. You can see the size. It's just about five gallons. And that only lasts us maybe three days That's, of normal usage, yeah. right? Yeah. So you got to stay on top of it. You do. Um, I, we'd like to drink our fluids, especially when you're out in sort of the desert. Yeah, drink corner. your fluids drink for sure. Drink your fluids. Yes. But you got to put them somewhere. And unfortunately, it goes into yeah. a cassette toilet. And so we try to be uh, very careful, right? We got to keep a you know, we kind of keep on track of where we are in terms of the uh, the cassette. Yeah. And last thing we want is in the middle of the night to have that cassette red light go off saying, oh, sorry, it's filled up. Because it, first of all, you don't like pulling it out when it's at full, full capacity, yeah. right? Let, let alone potentially for spilling it a little bit more, things like that, but just a little that heavy That would too. not be pretty. Yeah, and plus it's a bit heavy too, so. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Now, one of the things we found, you know, when fully trying to understand and the joy of using the cassette toilet is building habits around the cassette toilet, the use and functionality. Where, for instance, we do not do number two. I know this sounds graphic, but we don't do a number two in our cassette toilet. And so I'm sure they're probably saying, well, where the heck do you go then? What do you do? Well, we actually have a pop-up tent, a foldable pop-up tent that has a foldable toilet and eco-friendly bags that we use, and yes, that's the way we do it. Yeah, exactly, and if we're in the forest, we certainly make use of the forest, both for one and two, to extend the life Mother of nature. the cassette toilet. Now, one thing we should say here, to be brutally honest, when we first picked up our Winnebago, we actually drove it from Iowa to Las Vegas, our first cassette toilet, the receptacle, oh, actually that. broke, oh. the, the latch, system just stopped working and that was that was a shock we did not expect that because we had heard that these are actually quite reliable yeah. right but fortunately we had a spare a square to spare no yeah. we had a spare and that's what saved us from really having some problems on that long trek back to Las Vegas so yes I think that's one of the downsides to having a cassette toilet is you're constantly in use of right. the latch um, and which may bring it to more susceptibility of breaking. So having that additional or that spare does come in handy for right. situations like that. Exactly. So because you don't want you don't want a broken black tank, and it's basically your black tank, right? Oh, yeah. So that needs to work. So we actually always carry a spare now. All right. So I think it's a good point for us to show you exactly how this cassette toilet works. So let's go take a look. Very simple. Is there's a little latch on the side that you flip, and I'll show you that in just a second after you do your business. Basically, I will put some water in like that. Pumps it, circulates it there. There it is. Yay! I close that and I take the latch and flip it like so and close it back up. Voila, like magic, it's gone. And I put the lid down so that you don't have splashing. Now, one of the best things to do is to keep it down all the time so there's no air that tends to build up in that because if you open it up with that top open, you might get something in your eye. <laughs> you're not going to be happy about so close flush success you know before we go to the last tip on the cassette toilet we should tell them something oh right? i know what you're about to and say we have some uh, big news coming up we are going full-time rv living with our two kitties Yay. and we're going to kick it off with just a massive trip across the country we're going to film it all so if you have not subscribed yet, please do so. Yes, and please make sure you also subscribe to our newsletter, turnitupworld.com forward slash newsletter. We're gonna be releasing those weekly, making announcements. We may be in an area or city near you. And if you know a really cool spot that we should check out in your area, yes. maybe put it in the comment section below because it's going to be quite the journey and right. I'm looking forward to getting all up yeah. in it. Now, are you all nervous? Are you a little nervous? Oh, a little nervous. We're a little I'm nervous, guys. Nervous. It's like rookies on the road. Hey, Full -time. baby. Full time army living. Now that we got all that good stuff out of the way, last but certainly not least, one thing we do not do, and a lot of folks, it's, it's kind of a mixed feeling about this. We don't put toilet paper down our cassette. We actually just properly put that in the garbage can or the waste. Right, exactly, and that works for us. I mean, it's like no number two, no toilet paper. We just kind of keep it simple. 
and that's just how we roll. Yeah, I mean, we've spoken to others that are comfortable doing everything up in that piece, but not us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, thank you. Hey, y'all, we're Tanya and Dave from Let's Turn It Up World. And for those of you that are new here, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you don't miss an adventure or an update. And yes, we are camping in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I guess we're snowbirds that actually don't fly away in the winter. Yeah, we're real snowbirds. We don't run away from it. We embrace it. <laughs> Now, we have been full-time RV living for over a year now. No, that's right. We've met a lot of uh, full-time RVers, both in RV life and van life, that actually are pulling away from full-time RV life. Yeah, they're quitting, you guys. So today, we're not only going to tell you about why RVers are quitting full-time RV life, we're going to show you why you might want to reconsider full-time RV living. Right now, let's kick this off. We are here at Fletcher View Campground, and this is Bob. He has been the camp ground host here for six years and over the last year there's been such an, a substantial increase in folks trying to camp here you can't get a spot but I'm gonna let him tell you about that <laughs> already I'm gonna say it all in a nutshell basically in the summertime when it's 110 down in the valley people want to live here uh, so most of the people max out the 14 days uh, the first come first serves of course the most you can stay is the 14 days a lot of our reservations come in they can only get it for one day but they want to stay longer so what do they do? Is there an opening on a first come, first serve? If there is, they grab it and they max out the 14 days. People want to camp here so bad, next door in the picnic area, that becomes a campground too in the summertime. People want to camp here so bad as they camp there, every morning there's a little group that comes walking over asking who's leaving today? Who's leaving today? Who's leaving today? And if anybody's leaving today, that spot is taken very quickly. So if you're a first come person driving up the mountain that day, you're basically going to be out of luck. So, so Bob, <laughs> who's leaving today? Nobody right now. I know I know two people that are leaving tomorrow. But okay. Uh, one is behind the camera at this moment. Oh, <laughs> but if they want, they can stay. I think they have 12 more days they can do yeah. it before they max it out. Yeah. And just another side note, too. If you want to camp here and you have a good-sized rig and you're doing a first-come, first-serve, Leave the rig at home, particularly if you live in the valley. Leave the rig at home, come up in your smaller vehicle, your truck, your car, whatever. Get the site, go home and get the rig. Sites have to be occupied the night, the first night that you camp here, ah. okay? And also, if you're pulling a 40-footer and you drive up the hill here and you see that our campground sign is full, don't pull in. We get a lot of people, they don't read signs. So we get 40 footers that pull in here. We might be a guilty of that. Not 40 footer <laughs> Not 40 though. Footer. <laughs> yes, but 40 footers become an issue to get out of here. And that's just a special note is please read the signage when you come up. And that that's saves... not just here, that's <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> that saves a lot of problems, headaches and misunderstandings. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Alrighty. Time to go warm up by the fire. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> So just one last point. Now this is the winter months as well. And we're here right now. We fortunately got a spot, but you can see right over here, you guys. Campground full. So already the campground is pretty booked right now and it becomes a waiting game like Bob was saying. So behind us is actually campsite seven here. It's, one, it's our favorite campsite here in the winter because it gets a lot of morning sun, which is really nice in the morning. What's Tiny doing back there? <laughs> nothing, okay. nothing, but, nothing. <laughs> but we got here to this campground about four days ago and this site was completely reserved the whole time. And the whole time we've been here, no one's been here. Empty. It's been empty our the whole time. Spot, empty, four days, we could have been right, right. here. You know, so that, that's kind of frustrating a little bit. Yeah, so if you're gonna make a reservation, hold to it or go online and try and cancel it so that we can get our favorite spot, just saying. <laughs> exactly.
Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs>Overnight camping costs at many RV resorts across the country have increased substantially. And that's actually true here at this RV resort outside Las Vegas, even for monthlies. Monthly rates have increased up to 30% across the board for campsites at this RV resort. And inflation has also impacted national park entrance fees. For example, outside Las Vegas at Red Rock Canyon, fees are going up 33% in January 1st from $15 to $20 per passenger vehicle. And when fees go up, it's kind of like taxes. They probably aren't coming down in the near future. So unfortunately, they're probably here to stay. So you need to budget it. Um, Absolutely, because you know, things probably won't change for the better in the near yeah. foreseeable future. So not only have the RV campground prices increased substantially, it's really hard to even find a spot in many of these. I'm talking daily and even monthly, which you can actually save some money in. This one in particular, this campground called the Oasis, we have been trying to call for monthly spots for several weeks now. And every day we've called the same answer. There are no spots available. You know what? Let's give it a try right now. Oasis Las Vegas RV Resort. How may I address your call? Hi, yes. I'm trying to inquire if you guys have monthly spots available. No, there's absolutely no uh, monthly spots available at all right now. Wow. Do you see any um, maybe the next week or two coming up or should we just keep trying? No, there's, um, right now we have a bunch of problems. People, uh, well, because people want that are here already want to stay longer and they can't because there's no sites. And um, so we really, really, I know we don't. I have like eight people, 10 people wow. in my boat that are desperate. Okay. So, there's nothing right now. We just had another lady, a traveling nurse. She needs it and we don't have it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, okay. You can still call though because it could change. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. I mean, see, you can't get a spot and you don't see any in the near foreseeable future, but you can see why this is a hot RV resort to come to. Look at that pool. Many, if not most, RVers still use propane for heat, hot water, and cooking, and we do as well. Now, we just spent a week in the mountains in the snow and the cold, and we used a lot of propane, so we're getting a bit low. We're going to go see if we can fill this up right now and let you know what it's going to cost us. Well, we're in luck, they have propane today. We've been here a few times before where actually they had run out of propane. And we've found that in a number of locations across the country that some places like some RV parks didn't have propane. But today, we're in luck, we're getting filled up. So a really quick tip while Dave is putting the propane tanks back into the RV is make sure you have a propane monitoring system. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have one of those so you know the levels of your propane before you head off on a trip, during and after. And we tend to use what is called the Mopeka monitoring system. So it's worked flawlessly for us thus far. We have an actual monitoring device inside the RV and we both have the apps installed on our phone. So it's just a really important tip to have. And if you're curious about what we use, there's a link in the description box below. All right, so we're back in business. Now it costs us $3.99 a gallon to get our propane filled up, which is still pretty darn expensive. Now it was more expensive, you know, about three to six months ago, but boy, that's still expensive. And same thing's true with gasoline and diesel. And that's actually causing a lot of full-time RVers to quit or at least stop really traveling around the country. If you travel any bit, you're gonna really pay higher prices for gasoline and diesel. And you're gonna see that in your budget. We actually did a video, which you can see right here of all of our RV living costs over the past year. And you'll see in that video, we talk a lot about gasoline prices and the impact it had on our budget. Hey babe, the propane's all set. Oh, that's awesome. Well, it looks like we are getting pretty low on groceries, so I think we need to make a grocery store stop. Now, obviously the prices are gonna vary from state to state at the grocery stores, but the higher grocery prices are across the board. And it's certainly another factor that's affecting all of us here in the RV space. Oh. 
So each and every one of us has been to the grocery store lately and we're all infected by the through the roof prices we're finding at these grocery stores. It definitely has an impact on a lot of us in the RV space and it can go even further impacting those with a smaller RV because they can't buy things in bulk because we don't have a place to store. So this is a prime example. A lot of us love our eggs. This has doubled in price from what it used to be for just a dozen eggs. And so it makes it even harder to wanna buy them because I love them so much, but it's double the price. Mm. You know, RV boondocking, also known as dry camping, off-grid and dispersed camping has become seriously popular over the last several years amongst outdoor enthusiasts and nomadic travelers living in a camper van or an RV. Why? Because RV boondocking offers a unique opportunity to really explore nature, disconnect from the daily hustle and bustle, and maybe have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine at your birthday suit with no one watching basically to experience what true freedom on the road feels like. However, Dave and I have been RV boondocking for a long time. And amidst the excitement and allure of RV boondocking, there are quite a few misconceptions and huge lies that go unaddressed. Woo, I will tell you, it is definitely getting hot here in Nevada, right babe? Oh, it's definitely getting hot. Woo, hold on just for a second. Okay, you got a bit. All right. Woo, so today we're gonna uncover seven huge lies about RV boondocking that no one really talks about. Well, we are. Well, let's kick this off. Number one, boondocking is always free. Yes, that's a common misconception. Yeah. Well, boondocking can be free. Many public lands, such as state parks, and even actually some Bureau of Land Management areas, or BLM land, require fees and permits to stay overnight. Now, while these fees will be lower generally than what you'll find at campgrounds, you still need to factor those fees into your budget. Yeah, that's absolutely right. An example is we actually stayed at a place called La Pusa Long-Term BLM Land and Quartzsite, and we had to pay a flat fee of $40. Whether you're staying one day or the max of 14 days, we had to pay that flat fee of 40 bucks so keep that in mind when you're off thinking about boondocking some of these places do require a fee so budget for it you can boondock anywhere wrong you know truth be told boondocking especially today have really become subject to local laws and regulations you know many areas don't even allow overnight camping or they put restrictions on exactly where you can park your rv you know this really pertains to a lot of places like cities or municipalities which have made it downright illegal to park anywhere that's not a campground or an rv park and a lot of times those come with fees and remember we had a, a perfect example of this was in san diego we where we tried to find places we can overnight camp that were basically free now it's a city environment but we couldn't do it there were signs everywhere that right. said no overnight camping so you had to park in an rv park or rv campground and nine times out of ten those come with a fee. Related to this are time limitations for camping at various locations. Often public lands have limits in place in terms of how long you can camp at a site. For example, BLM land typically only allows you to camp concurrently for 14 days. Yes. Right, so you need to keep that in mind and also be uh, cognizant of other campers looking for spots if you're staying for that full 14 days. You can always find the perfect boondocking spot. <laughs> <laughs> You know, with the increasing popularity of RV life and van life, especially over the last several years, going that perfect boondocking spot is virtually impossible. And it can be really challenging, especially during peak season. It's certainly going to require careful research, knowledge of local regulations, and you may even have to do some trip scouting. Let's face it, preparation and flexibility are going to be your best friend for trying to secure the perfect boondocking spot. And Dave's got the perfect tip for that. Thanks, Beth. If you're looking for that choice boondocking spot during peak season or on weekends, we recommend getting there early in the day. This is super important because places fill up during the day. So get there early and you may just get lucky. You won't need any amenities while boondocking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, while boondocking allows you to disconnect from utilities, it still requires proper planning for water, power, and waste management. I mean, solar, generators, and conserving resources becomes essential. Now, we have a 50-gallon fresh, a 50-gallon gray, and an Insta-hot water system. And for our size rig, that's 
great, but you still have to be careful when it comes to taking those showers, whether it's long showers or frequent showers. You gotta diminish that. And that's just the way it is when you're in the boondocking life living in a van. So we do this as well. Get some baby wipes. They make great scents. There's cocoa butter, make it soft, there's lavender to help you relax and get all up in them crevices. It'll save your water. <laughs> <laughs> now that was well said, babe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Fresh. <laughs> <laughs> now, in addition to managing our water consumption, managing our power consumption while boondocking is extremely important. Now, fortunately for us, our rig has many redundant systems with our lithium batteries, our solar, our generator, mm -hmm. and also our propane. Now, depending on the so time of year, it really puts different strains on the system. During the summer months in the hot conditions, we put a lot of strain on our batteries and sometimes I have to run the generator as well to really top off those batteries running the air conditioning, right? Now in the winter months, we don't really use the batteries as much or the generator, but we use propane heating system all the time, as you can understand that doing in cold weather camping. We needed careful tabs on what our propane levels are. Well, what about waste? Well, when it comes to trash and food waste, it can be pretty challenging. Now, you don't want your rig full of smelly garbage while you're off boondocking in some beautiful wilderness. So for us, when we're boondocking, we tend to separate our waste into your plastic bags. We put them in our garage space away from our living space, which allows that smell to not into our home until we can actually get to a public space where we can dump the trash. For us, one of our biggest boondocking challenges is often our small five gallon cassette toilet. Ooh. We're off boondocking for quite a while. What we'll do is actually set up an outside tent toilet, right? Yeah. A little kind of a porta potty. My portable poop tent. <laughs> in the tent, <laughs> right? And that's where we take our poop effectively. Yes. Number two, just being totally open here, right? And then in terms of to conserve and kind of prolong our cassette toilet capacity, I mean, we'll pee outside in the wilderness quite a bit as well, mm -hmm. right? So obviously you don't do that when you're around a lot of people, but if you're off on your own boondocking, that's a way to definitely prolong our ability to stay out. We truly become one with nature. The animals do it, we're human animals, so you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and basically, and any of the waste in, of course, the outside porta potty will seal it up and bring that back with us as well when we actually find a place to dump it later on. Absolutely. It's easy to stay connected while boondocking. You know, truth be told, boondocking often means little to no cell service or Wi-Fi. So you're gonna either have to prepare for a digital detox or invest in a mobile signal booster or satellite if that's crucial to you. Now while some boondocking enthusiasts and even us at times wanna venture off into some far remote places to really stay disconnected, we certainly feel it's important to have some sort of connectivity in case there's an emergency that you need to get to. Now, Dave and I, we've invested in hotspots. We even have Starlink for those areas where hotspots don't work whatsoever. You have a much better chance of uh, surviving with, with some sort of satellite, like Starlink. <laughs> and for those of you who might, might be asking, well, why do you have hotspots and a Starlink? Well, you obviously know we're full-time content creators, so it's really crucial for us to be connected all the time. Boondocking is always safe. While many boondocking areas are safe, it's important to research and assess the safety of the area beforehand. Many areas may have challenging roads, may have even uh, some security risks in the area, may have wildlife issues. So make sure you understand that before you head off into that remote area. Can you overnight here at the Bucky's in Fort Worth, Texas? Access denied. <laughs> and while boondocking offers incredible experiences, it doesn't come without risk. So we actually feel you should know where your closest medical facility is in case you need emergency treatment. But we also feel we've heard a lot of this on the road from couples that may have driven or drive bigger rigs. It's really important for you ladies to get out there and drive those rigs as well, especially if you're thinking about the boondocking life, because if you get into an emergency situation, you need to know how to drive that vehicle as much as your husband does. So get out there and take control of that big old wheel. Take control of that big old wheel. Take control. Just like that. <laughs> Just like that. You don't need to worry or prepare for wildlife encounters. You crazy. Boondocking, truth be told, takes you quite often into natural areas where wildlife roams freely, right? And so it's very important to be aware of your local wildlife. What are the animals there? What do you need to be aware of? For example, if you're in bear country, you need to be very careful with your food and your food waste. You want to make sure hey, that that is stored in, in bear safe containers, certainly if it's outside and also in your rig. You don't want your campsite to become a smorgasbord for bears coming into the campsite. Hey bear! Yes. Hey bear! Oh! 
Hey, bear. Also, if you have pets, especially cats or small dogs, please be very careful when you're camping with them out in the wilderness. You don't want your furry family friends to be stalked by predators, and they are out there. From coyotes, there's foxes, there's bobcats, even owls. Just be very careful when you're out there with your pets. You know, we actually lost one of our cats previously to predators when we were living in the woods, and it's clearly something we never want to happen again. So. Please, when you're out there camping with your furry friends, keep a close eye on where they are and just know your surroundings. Oh, I forgot to mention something. Oh yeah, what's that? We have an awesome private community called our Turn It Up World Insiders, aka Games, <laughs> over on Patreon, which allows you behind the scenes access to more, you know, get to know us a little bit better, for us to get to know you a little bit better. We have private live streams. We have, oh my goodness, merch. New merch coming. Yes. New merch coming. We got early access to the like new limited merch. Limited edition. Limited edition. And we now have Trivia Night, our members only Trivia Night, where you can win prizes. Hang out with us. And we'll leave a link in the description box below. Check it out. We got some bonuses. <laughs> Bonus number one. Boondocking is for everyone and for every rig out there. Boondocking encourages self-sufficiency, but it's really easy and natural to miss the conveniences of traditional campgrounds like hookups, showers, laundry facilities, and even recreational amenities. You have to be prepared for a different type of lifestyle, which also means you may have to prepare your rig for that lifestyle. Like you may need to get solar, lithium batteries, and if you plan on going even further off-grid, you might want to invest in something like a winch on your, your rig if it's a motorhome, or you might want to make sure you get something like a frontal hitch to get you out of those sticky situations. You know, it's really crucial to evaluate your preferences, your camping style, and your comfortability before you go off embarking on boondocking adventure. Well, boondocking is possible with various different RV sizes. It's very important to acknowledge that smaller rigs certainly have an advantage getting to remote and harder to get locations, right? I mean, larger rigs may have some difficulty getting to these locations, so may require additional planning and things like that. So just be aware of that. We actually opted for a 23 foot rig with all wheel drive because we wanted to those remote locations, recognizing that we needed that flexibility to do so and that a larger rig maybe wouldn't be able to get there. Now, of course, that comes with a trade-off. Like obviously our rig does not have the same size that you get in the class that is in the fifth wheel. Storage is right? less. Exactly. But everything comes with a trade-off and for us, getting to those re remote locations was more important. Absolutely. I love going off, having my morning cup of coffee, my birthday suit and nobody's around but me and the birds baby now let me just say this if you're really nervous about getting into boondocking but want to give it a try but don't really know the capabilities of your rig one thing you can do if you're in an rv park just unplug yes right unplug in the rv park and just see how you like it obviously you aren't you know, in some remote location, but at least you can test your rig and just see what it's like for you living in that rig on plug. Yeah, it really helps you to understand the capabilities. Yes. And by doing that, you can know how long you can go off, how much consumption you need to save yeah. and what you need to pull back on before you actually get off into that remote area. Help Tanya and Dave. Exactly. Because we just might not be there. Boondocking is a solitary experience. Boondocking can be solitary experience. It certainly does not have to be. And it, it can actually be a great way to build bonds with like-minded individuals who love boondocking and love, you know, just getting out there and just living the life, yes, right? Absolutely. Unhooked, unplugged. And actually one of our best experiences in our rig was boondocking and doing a caravan with other folks in our in desert snow in this echo right we had an amazing time in utah overlanding and boondocking in just in some incredible remote locations and really built some lasting friendships yeah and great memories dave and i absolutely love boondocking and rv boondocking is an exciting way to really get out there and explore and enjoy the great outdoors but it's essential to separate the fact from the fiction you know by us dispelling these seven lies about boondocking we're hoping to equip you with you know, more realistic expectations and practical knowledge. Remember to research, plan, and practice responsible camping to make the most of your boondocking adventure. Yeah, that's right. Remember to embrace the freedom, connect with nature, and just really enjoy the unique experiences that boondocking has to offer. There are a number of laws that van lifers and RVers alike need to be aware of in order to stay out of big trouble. You know, Dave and I have been living in our camper van for over a year now, and we've seen things and broken some of these laws without even being aware that we're breaking them. Them. Have we gotten caught before any of these? Thank God, no. <laughs> Today, we're sharing 11 laws folks in the van life and RV community break. Some of these might surprise you, and a few you might be breaking without even realizing it. All right, 
let's get into it. First up, sleeping overnight on some city streets and public parking areas. In recent years, it's become more and more difficult to find overnight parking. I think everyone in the RV community and van life community understands this. And uh, in certain cities and municipalities, it's actually illegal to sleep overnight in your RV or van. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we are recently in San Diego testing out the all new electric camper van, which is super fun. But we noticed signs everywhere, everywhere basically stating no overnight parking from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., which eliminated anyone trying to camp or sleep on the side of those quiet streets. Now, we will say that we certainly saw plenty of van lifers doing so. Yeah, right? and there were car there, campers. Yeah, there were car campers there, clearly parking on the side of the street and sleeping overnight during those hours. Yeah. So they're risking the knock, risking the fine. Yeah, and they may not have seen, maybe they pulled in late, who knows, and not have read the sign or, you know, when we were going, you know, past, I just, yeah, be very careful because like Dave said, you don't want to wake up with a boot. Next up, sleeping overnight at some state rest areas. Now, many states have been cracking down on how long you can rest in their highway rest areas. An example of this is Tennessee. They only allow a max of two hours resting in their highway campgrounds, which is kind of weird. That's crazy. That is crazy. It does not seem like any kind of rest to me. No, not yeah. at all. And Florida, while well, they give you a little bit more of a break, they're saying non-commercial vehicles can have three hours in their resting areas, no more. That's also what? Right. And you know, they're probably trying to also leave room for truckers too. And I know our veers and van lifers have been taking up spaces, so we understand that. Yeah. But certainly it can be illegal if you're trying to spend the night overnight in a rest area. Make sure you know the rules of the state, the laws of the state, mm -hmm. as well as the laws of that particular rest area. You know, pay attention to signs. Yes, absolutely. And when you are going to spots that will allow you to camp overnight, like Dave was saying, just be respectful of the truckers. Yeah. You know, the, the homeboys and homegirls that are out there doing their thing, uh, delivering and driving across the country, they're a lot bigger than most of us. So leave room for them. Drinking alcohol in some state parks. Mm. That's right. Some state parks actually make it illegal to bring and drink alcohol in those parks. We've noticed that particularly in California, mm -hmm. right? Now, at the same time, these same state parks allowed van dwellers and RVers to go and spend the night in those parks. And so you do have to wonder, were folks actually cracking open a drink in those rates? Because if they were doing so, technically they were breaking the law. Yeah. And there's no, no idea how strictly that is enforced, but just be aware of that. If you're staying in a state park, understand the rules regarding alcohol and alcohol consumption. Yeah, and nine times out of 10, there will be signs will be staring you right in your face if you look for them. Just, just saying. Driving overweight in your camper van. You know, every rig has a weight capacity. So even if you can fit all your belongings in your rig, you have to be aware of the weight capacity limit. You know, we know to this day, there are probably a ton of folks still driving overweight in their RVs. You know, when we first got our RV, we were super excited. We loaded up our RV before hitting the road. We ended up getting to a way station and quickly found out that we were overweight and had to make some adjustments. It's crazy. Yeah, and it can be really tough too, especially if you're full time, you're trying to bring all your belongings with you inside your rig. And yet, like Tanya said, we found we were overweight. You have to make a tough decision on what to bring and yeah, what not to bring. Exactly. I like, like, you know, my Cadbury eggs, my Grogu, um, my extra blanket, my Bucky's, my extra Bucky's beaver nuggets, um, you know, all that good stuff. You need everything. Yeah. And on a related point, we've heard stories and rumors of insurance companies actually trying to deny claims from folks that maybe were driving overweight in their rigs. And we don't know if it's true or not. We'd love to hear from you. If any of you have direct experience with insurance companies trying to deny claims in that situation, please let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear about it. Yeah, and you, it's not directly from you, and right. you know this has happened to someone you know. Let us know about it as well so we can put those rumors to rest once and for all. Driving through some tunnels with propane. 
quite a few tunnels prohibit propane in them due to safety concerns. And that's because propane is actually heavier than air and can pull at the bottom of tunnels. And so if propane is prohibited in those tunnels, just make sure you do not take your tanks or your rig inside them. Not only is it illegal, but it's also dangerous. And on a secondary note, we actually recommend that you always turn off your propane while driving. While it may not always be technically illegal, it's just much safer to do so. So an interesting fact that may surprise you is that Propane restrictions in tunnels generally depends on if, say, it's a tunnel that's uphill or downhill. Now, an uphill one, which is typically a mountain tunnel, looks like this. So, therefore, if propane is leaking, it's generally going to come out of one end of the tunnel or the other. But if you now flip that upside down to a tunnel that looks like this, which most of the times is underwater, well, think about that. Well, now you have the propane that's pooling in the center, which can become very dangerous and very hazardous. So, most of the times, propane restrictions might be fewer when you find places that look like this, tunnels that are more mountainous, than look like this. Hmm. Well, thank you, Professor Tanya. You're welcome. <laughs> dumping your gray water outside of approved dumping stations. Now, we have heard stories of some people actually dumping their gray water out in the woods and not at approved dump stations. And now this is generally illegal and you shouldn't do it. Now, some, some will argue that gray water is just soapy water and things like that. But the fact is, I mean, gray water does stink and it's definitely considered toxic uh, by many authorities. So just don't do it. All of the organizations that manage our federal lands have made it illegal to dump gray waters on the lands that they manage. Now, the lone exception to that is the Bureau of Land Management or BLM land. And even within that, there are many exceptions within BLM land where you can't dump your gray water. So just make sure you check very carefully uh, if you're going to go on BLM land. And our recommendation is just don't do it. Don't dump that gray water. Thank you, Professor Dave. Exceeding the maximum speed limit of your tires. Now this next one applies to our veers who are more likely in towables or fifth wheels with low rated tires. And the point is, is that many of those rigs actually have very small tires that may be only rated to go 55 miles an hour. So even if the speed limit on the highway you're on might be 70, right, you're limited to going 55. And so you should not exceed that for safety reasons. So definitely just don't do it. Be aware of what is the limitation of your tires. Driving with your hazard lights on. Now you often see RVers, camper vanners, and sometimes cars driving with their hazard lights on. And most times these are in situations where it's like fog or heavy rain or wind or snow. But in many states, this is illegal and sometimes can be more dangerous than just keeping them off. Now we do recognize it's common practice for big rigs to put on their hazard lights when they're going up mountainous roads. And it's basically to let other drivers know that they cannot maintain the speeds to get up those mountainous hills. So we're not really referring to that situation. Darkly tinted windows. You know, states vary when it comes to regulations regarding tinting on your rig. As a matter of fact, some are very restrictive. Examples like New Hampshire, New Jersey, and Vermont, they are super restrictive. And I think they don't even allow tinting on those front two windows. So moral of the story is, if you're gonna be driving in places that have high restrictions regarding front window tinting and you have them, you might not wanna go there because if they require you to take them off, you don't have to take them off. So, uh, okay, um, let me ask you this question then, Dave. So, so sure. if I'm, I'm not gonna actually remove my tenting, it costs me a lot of money to do that. So what should I do if I'm driving in one of those restrictive states? Well, you can drive with your windows <laughs> down. Oh. Just hope, hope it's not in the middle of winter. Yeah, <laughs> drive with my windows down. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks, Professor Dave. <laughs> Living in your RV or even parking your RV on your own gosh dang property. Yes, this one surprises us a bit, yeah. right? If you own your property, you think, okay, we can park or live in our RV on the property. That's actually not necessarily true. Many towns and municipalities have strict regulations about where you can park your RV and may actually have a limitation on the time you can actually keep your RV on your own property. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that can even apply to a lot of places that have like an HOA. Oh yeah. They will tell you, probably right in those documents, no RVs allowed. And so you'll have to find an alternate place for that RV and the rules can change at any minute. Exactly. So, right. Yeah. So if you do own land, make sure you understand what the regulations are on that property for an RV, keeping it there and also living in it. Let's talk about taxes. You know, everyone's favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> state tax domicile rule. Can a state tax you as a resident? Yes, taxes, right? Everyone's favorite. And uh, now this is really about where, what state 
are you basically domiciled in for tax purposes. And the general rule, which is the most common rule in most states, is the 183-day rule, meaning if you spend more than 183 days in a particular state during the tax year, you're gonna be deemed to be a resident and domiciled in that state for tax purposes, which means then they will tax you in that state, tax your income in that state. Now these rules vary from state to state, so be aware of the domicile rules, especially for your specific situation, and also if you're gonna be in one particular state for an extensive amount of time. Now real quick, here's one more law and rule that you need to be aware of, especially if you travel with pets. Bringing your pets on national park trails and wilderness areas. In most national parks, pets are not allowed on trails or the wilderness areas, and it's for the protection of your four-legged friends as well as the protection of the local plants and wildlife. Now, pets are generally permitted in designated areas inside the national parks. As a matter of fact, there may even be specific trails for you and your pets, so long as they're on a leash no longer than six feet. Now, rules do vary from park to park, so make sure you check with the park you're visiting. Make sure you understand the rules for that particular park regarding your pets. Now, if there are any laws that van life is or RVers often break while living in a camper van that we didn't mention, please let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear about them. Absolutely, and take a second, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you get notified every time we post a new video and uh, we'll see you in the next one.